There's always been a lot of crossover between video games and mythology, and I don't think I've ever come across a game that manages to bridge this gap nearly as well as Hades. If you've come here wanting to know if Hades is good, I can answer that one pretty quickly. Yes, it is. However, this video isn't going to focus at all on any of the more stereotypical, reviewable aspects of the game, and instead we're going to focus exclusively on the mythology that it's based upon, and all the lore surrounding it. Very simply, in this video, we're going to go through virtually everything that Hades has to offer, bit by bit, really looking into the actual, tangible mythology behind each individual element. In doing this, I'm hoping to achieve three things. One, that we'll be able to really gain a comprehensive understanding of what informed the choices Supergiant made in their creative process. Two, we'll be able to see how closely the myth in the game matches pre-existing established mythology. And most importantly, three, we'll hopefully learn a fair bit of fun stuff along the way too. So think of this video as like a Hades-specific Greek myth crash course. If you played Hades and at any point wondered at all about any of the stories, characters, locations, or weapons depicted in it, my hope is that you'll be able to find all the info you would ever need right here in this video. That being said, I'm sorry to keep you waiting, but there's just a few more things I need to mention before we dive in. Firstly, this video will contain spoilers. I don't think we can consider any of the mythology itself as a spoiler really, but Hades has an exceptional narrative that is definitely worth experiencing for yourself, and this video will spoil the events of that narrative in order to adequately cover every topic. So if you don't want to be spoiled, here's your warning. Secondly, I'd like to set out the structure of the video to make it a bit easier to understand. As you'll know if you've played Hades, there's an in-game codex providing a wee bit of additional info for everything you come across as you play. I'm going to be using this codex as a guide, meaning that for the most part I will cover topics in this video in the same order in which they appear in the codex. As you can see, this video is pretty long, and as such each individual part will be timestamped in the description, meaning that if you want to skip through, only watch certain bits, or even re-watch a previous bit after learning about another related piece of myth, the option is there to make it a bit easier for you. It's also worth noting that canonically in the game all the codex entries are written by Achilles, but we'll learn more about that later. Anyway, sorry to keep going on, but I need to bring up two more things. Firstly, I need to mention how I'm going to approach the analysis and say ahead of time that it's all going to depend on context. Nearly everything I talk about will be based, at least initially, upon material that exists within the game. But when we come to external resources, we'll be looking at some more kind of ancient sources, some more informal stuff, and even other more contemporary iterations of the myths in question. It will all depend on what's being said, so no two sections will be the same. And finally, I need to clarify that I am not an expert or an academic. I do have a real interest in this stuff, and I spend a lot of time reading about it, but there's every chance I'm wrong on certain bits here and there. I've researched everything to the best of my ability, but if there's any mistakes or I miss something out, I'm sorry about that. Anyway, I think that's it. I appreciate your patience in letting me get all that out, and now we can finally jump in and get started. It's only appropriate that our analysis begins with the game's very own namesake, Hades. So when I'm looking at a character like Hades, there are four main things I'm interested in, all of which are based on what you can find in the game. One, this is the most basic one, who are they? What are they like? Two, appearance and design. Are there any aesthetic elements worth mentioning, any sort of iconography specific to that character that you can find in the game's art? Three, the information given in the game regarding that character, be it dialogue, relationships with other characters, or any allusions to myths or stories throughout the narrative relevant to the character in question. And four, this is the crux of the whole video, how well does all of the above stand up to the actual mythology? Are the portrayals accurate or not? Do they line up with our collective understanding of that character? And ultimately, for every point made, is there mythological precedent for what's brought up? So who is Hades? In Greek myth, Hades is the god of the dead, the king of the underworld. He isn't the god of death, however, that's Thanatos, but we'll get to him soon. The game depicts Hades as being pretty grumpy, if we're going to put it nicely. He's short with everyone around him, bitter at his endless workload, and unless directed at Persephone, has a disregard for affectionate behaviour, as evidenced by his reaction here as Zagreus pets Cerberus. This lines up pretty nicely with the ancient understanding of Hades too. The game states that his name inspires fear and penitence, which is totally true because back in the day it was pretty common to euphemize in order to avoid invoking his name directly. Two examples for you. 
The first is Polydegmon, sometimes rendered as Polydectes, meaning something like, one who receives many. You might recognise the poly at the beginning, which is used all the time in English, to have the same meaning of many, like in Polygon, Polytheism, and so on. This was arguably most famously used by Aeschylus in his tragedy Prometheus Bound, but it still isn't as well known as the next euphemism, which is Pluton, essentially meaning the wealthy one. This one always seems to bring about a bit of confusion nowadays, because it's so similar to the name of another god, Plutos, who was the god of wealth in Greek myth, but it is worth reinforcing that, at this point, these two were not yet the same god. By the time we got to Roman myth, and Hades became Pluto, the line between Pluton and Plutos was much more blurred. In the game, there are a few instances in which Hades possessing enormous wealth is brought up, and you can see in these two examples, one saying he has wealth beyond imagining, and the next calling Hades god of the dead, god of riches. This last one is tricky, because you could argue, if you were being pernickety about it, that Hades wasn't technically the god of riches, as we've just discussed, but I think that's being a bit harsh, because he did still have dominion and possession over everything within the earth. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been named Pluton. Plus, by all accounts, this name was in pretty regular use when discussing Hades, probably the most commonly used euphemism for him, starting around the 5th century BC, and even being used in the works of Plato and Sophocles. So it's fair to say that his wealth was a well-ingrained part of his myth. But anyway, back to the original point. It's a relatively throwaway phrase, but the game is literally dead on. The name of Hades itself was enough to inspire fear. It's worth mentioning though, despite having some antagonistic traits, Hades isn't inherently evil, in mythology or in this game. I think the depiction of Hades in Disney's Hercules did the collective understanding of the character absolutely no favours in that regard, because Hades in mythology was all about balance rather than vengeance. That isn't to say that there isn't precedent implying that Hades was displeased at his lot in life, and in-game, Megara does mention the bonds between Hades and the other Olympians as fraying. We'll discuss how Hades ended up in the underworld a bit more in the Poseidon section. Anyway, having just discussed his wealth, let's look closer at his design, because the link there is clear. He's covered in gemstones, we don't need any additional analysis there, we already get that. Two things that are worth mentioning though are his beard and the skull on his shoulder. Let's start with the beard, specifically the shape of it. The iconography here is probably the most ubiquitous within the game, the logo, if you will, that is specific to the underworld and Hades in particular. Looking at the keepsakes, I think we can just call it the Sigil of the Dead to make it a bit easier. You can find it everywhere, in the House of Hades, on Achilles' clasp, on the coins you pick up, and I'm pretty sure that it's just made up for this game, in the sense that you won't find this particular piece of imagery in Greek mythology. That being said, I'm almost certain it's supposed to represent the weapon most associated with Hades in myth, the bident. It's a weird word, much less common than trident, but it's as it sounds, it's just a two-pronged spear. Look at this artwork, for example. It's technically of Pluto, but the point is the same, he's depicted specifically with the Biden. Some people also think this might be the reason why the devil is sometimes depicted with a pitchfork, one mythology bleeding into another, but I don't have anything concrete to back that up, it's just cool to think about. I really like that they chose the Biden to represent Hades in the game, especially considering it's what he wields when you fight him, and it has a definite historical precedent. As for the skull on his shoulder, we're going to slightly veer off the Hades path and discuss something else super interesting. Typhon. Zagreus asks Hades about the skull, and he replies that he did not chronicle all Typhon's wretched offspring, and shortly after, Zagreus calls him the most hideous monstrosity of all time, which isn't the glowing endorsement Typhon was hoping for. So let's digress a bit, it's not about Hades, but it's far too interesting not to mention, although I'll try to keep it shortish. Who was Typhon? According to Hesiod, a Greek poet who will come up a lot in this video, Typhon was the child of the primordial gods Gaia and Tartarus, we'll discuss primordial gods in the next section, and is for sure considered one of the most mental monstrosities ever to show up in Greek mythology. There are too many varied descriptions of his appearance to conclusively make a point about it, but my favourite description is from Apollodorus, who said Typhon was so huge that his head brushed the stars, that dragon heads protruded from his hands, and vipers coiled his thighs. Here's a piece of art from 1619 that gives life to this description. Typhon was nightmarish enough on his own, but he was also famous for consorting with fellow monstrosity Echidna, yes the animal is named after her by the way, and producing pretty much every fearsome creature in the entirety of Greek myth. This is what Hades was referring to. 
It's a bit harsh of him to call all their offspring wretched, especially considering that his wee dog Cerberus was also one of their children. As for the specific creature the skull came from, I don't know, because I highly doubt that it's based off an actual monster. Nonetheless, I love the reasoning behind the design, and it's really fun to bring Typhon into the mix narratively, considering the importance of the parts their monstrous children play throughout Greek myth. The only other main thing about Hades that I haven't discussed yet, and that won't come up later, is the Helm of Darkness. You only see this when you're about to fight him, and Zagreus mentions it the first time you reach the Hades fight, saying that he's touched that he would dust it off on his account. The Helm of Darkness almost sounds too high fantasy to actually be in Greek mythology, but it is, it's just sometimes called other things, like the Helm of Hades or the Cap of Invisibility, which does exactly as it says on the tin, and is the reason why sometimes during the Hades fight he just vanishes for a few seconds. According to the Bibliotheca, a compendium of myths compiled either in the centuries before or after 0 AD, depending on who you ask, the Helm of Darkness was made for Hades specifically, by the Cyclopes, to aid in the Titanomachy, which is the name for the war between the Titans and the Gods. Again, something we'll discuss in a bit more length later on. It's pretty interesting to think about mythological artifacts like this, and the knock-on effect that they've had through the medium of storytelling. The Helm of Darkness is pretty cool, and has likely influenced magical headwear through the ages, as silly as that sounds, from other mythologies to modern-day fantasy. A more concrete example of this happening can be found if you look at the Ring of Gyges, a magical ancient artifact brought up chiefly in Plato's Republic, which would grant the wearer invisibility, just like the Helm of Darkness. I don't know if there's a link between the two, but there might be. Does that sound familiar though? A ring granting invisibility? Whether or not there's a link between Tolkien and Plato is up for debate, but here's something else worth considering. It's well known that Tolkien was an expert in Old Norse, and based a lot of his writing on that branch of myth. If we're still talking rings, the one from Norse mythology that pops into my mind is the Andvaranaut, or Andvari's Gift, a cursed ring that would bring misfortune upon its bearer. Again, I'm not saying there's definitely a link, but it's worth thinking about, right? This is why mythology is so fascinating. Anyway, I think we've spent more than enough time with Hades, I should move on or this video will literally never end. I see. I appreciate your candor. Nevertheless, I thank you. I do not know how you accomplished what you did, but know that I am grateful for the outcome, even if I fail to act like it most of the time. Next up is Nyx, easily one of the best characters in the game, and almost definitely my favourite design. As her description makes clear, Nyx is Night Incarnate, a physical embodiment of the concept of Night. You would describe Nyx as a primordial deity, pretty much all of whom represent a realm, or at least some sort of large-scale idea. The first primordial deity was Chaos, who has a whole section later on. From Chaos sprung Nyx, Gaia, the Earth, and also Tartarus and Erebus, who, as you know if you've played the game, are better known as locations. But we'll get to that further down the line, there's a bit more to it than that. These primordial gods, as the name suggests, predate the gods that make up the Olympian pantheon that most people are familiar with by a long while, essentially having been around since the dawn of time. This is something the game brings up a fair amount, and can be seen in how Hades and Nyx interact. Hades may be in charge, but by no means is Nyx lesser to him, and she is not to be trifled with. Lines of dialogue like this are why she's such a good character. Interestingly, it isn't brought up in the game, but this formidable nature of hers also extended as far as Zeus, the king of the gods, who feared and revered Nyx, but we'll get to that when we discuss Hypnos. One other thing worth bringing up is another word to describe all of the gods in this first section, which is Chthonic. This gets used plenty in the game, because a fair few of the people who kick about your house are Chthonic deities. This word comes from the Greek Chthon, which I've almost definitely pronounced wrong, and basically means of the earth. If we're really simplifying it, the best way to understand what a Chthonic god is, is just to think about whether or not they predominantly hang out in the underworld. A few of the Chthonic deities you meet in this game are actually Nyx's children, as you can see in the codex description. It's also worth bringing up that the game hints at a disconnect between the Chthonic gods and the Olympians in this piece of dialogue from Athena. It's hard to say how much this is based in truth, though. The success of the game's narrative hinges on tension between the Underworld and the Olympians, but even though you get infighting amongst the gods in mythology, I don't know if there's much to suggest a divide like the one depicted in this game. 
That's fine though, you can take liberties with mythology, half the joy of it is seeing how depictions differ and evolve over time. Anyway, back to Nyx. As much as her design is excellent, I don't think there's actually really anything to discuss, for a pretty good reason. There's not much to base her off. You're hardly going to struggle looking for historical depictions of Hades, but Nyx is, to be honest, a minor character in comparison, and one who has been personified in art and sculpture, as you can see, albeit not frequently enough for a preconceived idea of her appearance to exist in our collective subconscious. In the excellent set of noclip documentaries covering the development and release of Hades, Greg Kasavin, the creative director for Supergiant Games, said this. Now that the game is out there and um, f folks have played it and seen what it's like, I, I get to talk a little bit more openly about one of the aspects of the world building and, and uh, the story that I've been so excited about, which is that we get to depict some of these characters from Greek myth that I, I don't think have ever been rendered in like modern media before. Hypnos or uh, Nyx or certainly Zagreus is not a character you have necessarily learned about in your one, you know, Greek mythology session in elementary school. Because of this dearth of reference points, Supergiant used what little info there is on Nyx to build a character. For example, she's the mother of half the underworld figures you'll come across, so making her motherly, having characters call her Mother Nyx, all makes sense. That sounds almost too obvious to bring up, but details surrounding any personality she may have had are so scant. Design-wise, the starry effect in her hair, the lunar pauldrons, they all look amazing, but are basically just modern creative control, and realistically, there was nothing else they ever could have been. Heading back to her maternal nature, there's one more thing worth talking about in that regard. In a conversation with Achilles, he mentions a few other of her children. Strife, Misery, and Doom. Technically, we'll discuss Strife later, but the point is that a lot of Nyx's children are best described as personifications of concepts. Even Hypnos and Thanatos are just meant to represent and explain the phenomena of sleep and death. So it's similar in a way to the primordial gods, but on a smaller scale, I guess. You get an amazing list of some of these personified deities in Book 6 of Virgil's Aeneid, which although written in Roman times, not Greek, is still an amazing mythological resource. Book 6 in particular, as it's entirely based around the underworld. And as a personal favourite of mine, it's going to come up a fair few times in this video. Anyway, look at these four lines taken from the really excellent 2020 translation by Shadi Barch. At the entrance, in Orcus's very jaws, grief and vengeful sorrow made their beds, and pale diseases, sad old age, and fear, and ill-advising hunger, and shameful poverty. This list does actually go on a wee while longer, but I think that's enough for now. This is from the part when Aeneas is entering the underworld, and these are all the things he sees around him. None of these are strife, misery, or doom, but some of these are also considered Nyx's children, old age or Geras, being perhaps the most prominent of them. The point is, though, that this is fascinating because it's an insight into how scary and nebulous concepts used to be rationalised and explained, which with modern retrospect is hugely common in Greek myth. Even Nyx was simply a way of rationalising the nighttime just as her daughter Hemera was a way of rationalising the daytime. Therefore, the fact that Supergiant managed to give Nyx such life to make what was previously little more than a concept so interesting is astounding. A reasonable guess, and not without some truth to it, but no, my child. My reason for helping you is simpler than that. It is because I love you. You may not be born of me, but I raised you like one of my own, and I have cared for you as I am capable. Nyx, I love you too. Thank you for everything. Next, we have the main character, the guy you play as, Zagreus. Zagreus is maybe the most complex character to discuss, because the myth surrounding him is all a bit jumbled. There's more than one version of him, and I don't think knowledge of him is at all common, so I guess what we're looking to find out is if his portrayal in-game matches any of these esoteric myths. Let's have a look then. Firstly, what is Zagreus the god of? In game, Achilles writes in the Codex that he thinks Zagreus is the god of blood, of life, as a way of explaining the link between him and Thanatos, two opposites inexorably drawn. I think this is really cool, because Greek mythology doesn't really have a god of either blood or life, and it makes sense within the context of the story, especially if you look at blood as having both a literal and more symbolic meaning. 
The former is obvious to look into, as he seems to be the only god who bleeds red. Electo calls him red blood consistently, and Hades even calls it an aberration at one point, which is a bit harsh, but pretty on brand for him. Bleeding red definitely seems normal, but in Greek myth, gods actually bleed a special kind of blood called ichor. In popular culture, it seems that ichor is generally considered to be gold, but I think that that's mostly because that's how it's described in the Percy Jackson books. Although that isn't without precedent, gold is the colour associated most frequently with power and immortality in Greek myth, as evidenced by things like the Golden Fleece or the Apples of the Hesperides. But there isn't really much in ancient sources that I can find to suggest that Ikor had a specific colour. It's possible that his blood is red because in the game he is still partly mortal. Persephone, his mother, is half god, half mortal in the game, so that makes Zagreus quarter mortal too. His parentage manifested in his heterochromia, one eye representing each parent, so it isn't outside the realm of possibility that he could bleed normally if taking after his mum's side. The other, more conceptual side of blood relates to the idea of family, which is the game's most prevalent overarching theme. The whole thing is about finding Persephone, developing bonds with others, helping to settle old scores, fostering an environment in which healthy relationships can bloom and blossom. The closest thing Greek myth has to a family god is probably either Hera or Hestia, both of whom we'll chat about briefly later on, but the kind of stuff we just mentioned above wasn't exactly in their remit. It's connected to what I said earlier. Greek myth doesn't have a god of blood or life, but does sometimes consider Zagreus to be the god of rebirth. It goes without saying that that fact makes the roguelike genre seem like the only choice for this game. Rebirth definitely has a link to blood and life, and arguably was also taken into account in the game when you learn that Zagreus was stillborn, but revived. Most of the Zagreus rebirth stuff is pretty confusing though, and makes Zagreus have a very different background than what you see in the game, so we'll actually discuss that stuff when we get to Dionysus later on. Essentially the latter half of that section will end up being Zagreus Part 2. As for other elements of godhood we can bring up in this Part 1, Zagreus is also considered a god of hunting, just like Artemis. And speaking of Artemis, she actually tells Zagreus that his name means Great Hunter. Unsurprisingly, Supergiant have done their research, as you can see on screen. Wherever possible, I'm going to try and avoid pronouncing Greek to preserve what little of my dignity remains. There's actually another possible etymology, but both are clearly based on hunting, so there's not much to argue about. I guess this is possibly transposed into the game through his extraordinary martial prowess. But for the most part, I don't think this element of his mythology actually plays much of a role. Probably my favourite thing about how Zagreus is depicted in Hades actually comes from two offhand remarks that seem to reference how niche a character he is. He says to Eurydice that he's surprised she's heard of him at all, and Theseus calls him a nameless, long forgotten minor god born of the depths. Which just seems like an insult, but I'm convinced that these were written into the game to reference how arcane, ambiguous, and little known Zagreus is in Greek mythology. Here's an example. During a supergiant panel at PAX West 2019, Greg Kasavin says this. Wait, what if we start in the underworld and it's about getting out of hell instead of going, going down into hell and you're, you're the son of freaking Hades because there's like a scrap of mythology suggesting that he has a son um, and we're all like, wait, that sounds pretty cool. If you're interested, the scrap he mentions is most likely from a fragment of a lost play by Aeschylus. So yeah, even in research, the character of Zagreus was essentially built off scraps, but that, in a way, is perfect. For pretty much everyone who plays Hades, Zagreus is going to be a blank canvas, because unlike characters with more comprehensive mythologies and more established traits and personalities from other modern media, Supergiant were able to basically make Zagreus whatever they wanted, without really having any baggage around making him a certain way, and this worked strongly in their favour. Like Nyx, it's tough to fact check some characters because of how much creative licence had to be taken. For example, in-game Zagreus has fiery feet, and I have not found a single iota of evidence that would have informed this choice from any myth, not just in Zagreus specific stuff. But that's okay. Zagreus as a character is still deeply steeped in pre-existing myth, some of it just happens to be a myth that isn't as much to do with him, but that's still just as valid as anything else. The bedchambers of Prince Zagreus lie in a perpetual state of utter disarray, despite his lord and master of the house repeatedly insisting that he pick everything up. Oh come on, it's not that bad, is it? 
Following on from Zagreus, we have Charon. You can see Charon's descriptor as Stygian Boatman. Just in case you don't know, Stygian is the adjectival form of Styx, referring to the River Styx, which is the river that leads into the Underworld. We'll chat more about the Styx later on. Charon is really interesting. He's one of Nyx's children, and as such, is technically a god. But to me, he's never seemed like one. This might sound weird, but I think it's because he's so exclusively associated with his work, more than any other deity I can think of in Greek myth. There is no Charon without his boat, and essentially no context that I can find in any myth that isn't linked to him ferrying people back and forth. It almost seems an ignoble job for a god, but there's no indication of Charon expressing discontentment for it. In the game, Nyx mentions that Charon has always been among the least dependent of her children, and that he is always content to steer his boat. She also mentions that Charon serves only this realm, and that seems to totally line up with actual myth. He ferries the dead to the underworld, and minds his own business. What a guy. There's actually a word to describe characters like Charon, figures in mythology whose job it is to help facilitate the newly deceased entering the underworld, and that word is psychopomp. It's an absolutely incredible word, I mean, sounds ridiculous. This actually has no real link to the game, psychopomp as a word is never mentioned in Hades as far as I know, but I have to tell you about it because not only does it sound hilarious, it has the coolest etymology of basically any word ever. As you can see on screen, it means soul conductor, it's just amazing. But there's actually basically no better way to explain what Charon does. And let's look a bit deeper into the logistics of what that actually entails. In the game, Charon runs the shop. Unsurprisingly, he did not run a wee riverside stall in Greek myth, but Charon handling the money matters in this game is definitely the most logical choice. Looking at his design, you can see all the coins hanging from round his shoulders. These are called obols. Basically, the idea behind this was that when you died in ancient Greece, you needed payment for Charon to ferry you across the Styx to the underworld, and as such, an obol was placed on the tongue of the deceased prior to burial, and it was believed that this would be used to secure passage. This is referenced in the game. Skelly has the obol still in his mouth, for example, and you can also see a coin in the mouths of these skulls that appear just above the death screen. On top of this, Thanatos mentions to Zagreus that everything is an exchange with Charon, so even though we never really see Charon ferry the dead in Hades, there are sufficient references to that element of his job. Although, I don't think there's much in mythology to support the fact that Charon hoards the money he collects, as the game suggests. As for Charon's appearance, there is no avoiding the fact that he is creepy as fuck, and that in Hades, everyone also thinks he is creepy as fuck. Ares calls him that foul boatman, Poseidon calls him disturbing, and even the fearsome Cerberus keeps his distance from Charon. Charon in mythology was also a wee bit creepy, but a bit less so than in the game. For starters, a lot of ancient sources describe his facial features, which are mostly obscured in Hades. As an example, if we head back to the Aeneid, you get this description. A sordid god. Down from his hairy chin a length of beard descends, uncombed, unclean. His eyes like hollow furnaces on fire. Charon was also depicted in art quite often, which lets us get a few different ideas about what his appearance could have been. Looking at these two, he mostly just looks like a normal old haggard guy, which again has definite precedent. He was mentioned as being old in works by both Euripides and Seneca, and to be honest, loads of others too. That being said, I think the way Charon was depicted in Hades is actually my favourite version I've ever seen and sums up the enigmatic nature of the character better than any other iteration. There's only one last thing to bring up here though, which is that he doesn't really speak in the game, he just kind of moans at you. Achilles writes in the Codex that Charon isn't much for conversation, and Nyx says to Zagreus that he should not mistake his lack of speech for lack of cleverness. This is a cool aspect of his character that totally works in the context of the game, but I'm pretty sure it's just made up. I don't think Charon is the chattiest personage in Greek myth, but when depicted in ancient history, poetry, or theatre, he still spoke. He has a speaking part in the Aristophanes comedy The Frogs, and heading back to the Aeneid, he shouts at Aeneas and the Sibyl, demanding to know why they've come to his riverbank, considering they aren't dead. So yeah, when it comes to Charon, it's a mixed bag accuracy-wise, but thankfully there isn't much correlation between accuracy and quality. It's like I said in the section about Nyx, and we'll doubtless say later, half the fun of mythology is seeing how things evolve, 
and the chances are the depiction of Charon in Hades will genuinely have an impact on future iterations of the character in other media, which is pretty incredible to think about. Charon, mate. As a long-time customer, I just wanted to take a moment to thank you again for your invaluable service as a part of my repeated attempts at getting out of here. What would I have done without your wares all these many times? Besides dying a lot faster. Well, I meant every word. This section is going to be a bit different to the first four, because here I'm going to basically discuss two characters at once those two being Hypnos and Thanatos. That might seem a bit weird, but I think it makes more sense. To be totally honest, although Hypnos and Thanatos seem like they play a pretty substantial role in how the underworld functions in the game, they are minor gods in comparison in actual mythology. And on top of that, they tend to be linked with each other. As such, I'll cover them both together. So, Hypnos is sleep incarnate, and Thanatos is death incarnate. Peaceful death, to be specific. Achilles mentions in the Codex that it is said that sleep is the cousin of death, by which he was most likely referring to the lyrics of New York State of Mind, in which Nas uses this phrase. Can't be a coincidence that you get the word ill in both Achilles and Illmatic. Kidding aside, they're actually brothers, not cousins, and are inextricably connected. Unsurprisingly, there are a few ancient sources which discuss the closeness of these two, as you can see on screen at the moment, and you can even find mention of this in Shakespeare. During Hamlet's famous to be or not to be soliloquy, you'll find to die, to sleep, twice within a few lines. It's also worth bringing up this painting by John William Waterhouse, Sleep and His Half-Brother Death. You can see that despite the closeness of sleep and death being an ancient idea, it's persisted in art to this day, really. Which is also why I found it interesting that they made Hypnos and Thanatos so different in Hades. In a second we'll discuss each of them individually, but when it comes to mythological precedent for how they interact together, the general vibe you get is efficient teamwork, the best example of which is probably to do with the death of the hero Sarpedon, who fought on the side of the Trojans during the Trojan War. I won't go into Trojan War stuff now, obviously we'll discuss that more when we get to Achilles and Patroclus, but the point is that after Sarpedon was killed in battle, his corpse was recovered by Apollo and given over to Hypnos and Thanatos, who together transported him to Lycia, his homeland, for burial. This all happens in the Iliad, and is famously depicted in this vase painting. You can see them both on either side, carrying the body. Hypnos and Thanatos were generally pretty benevolent gods, so this isn't a surprising scene. When it comes to in-game interactions between the two, the dynamic is pretty exclusively Hypnos being a klutz, and Thanatos and everyone else being annoyed with Hypnos. Nyx even checks with Zagreus if Hypnos' disposition bothers him, and Thanatos also says that he doesn't know what's worse, dying repeatedly or Hypnos. Obviously by the end it's clear that the two brothers love each other, and that the reasoning for the in-game dynamic is just like with the other characters who are based on insufficient or fragmented myth. It just makes it interesting. Hypnos and Thanatos honestly barely get a mention in Greek myth compared to a lot of the other characters you'll see in the game, so I like the dynamic they ended up going with. Having sleep be all goofy and death be all serious makes total sense. Now though, we'll discuss a wee bit about them individually, starting with Hypnos. Two main things that I'd like to bring up. Firstly, I mentioned during the next section earlier that there was some drama between her and Zeus, and that I'd mention it here. Basically, there just isn't much to talk about regarding Hypnos' portrayal in the game, so I'm just going to go into an interesting myth involving him. So Zeus and Hera are the king and queen of the gods, but they don't have the best relationship. Hera wanted to trick Zeus, and as part of her trick, asked Hypnos to make him fall asleep, so she could wreak a bit of havoc. When Zeus woke up, he had a proper tantrum and tried to hunt Hypnos down, but Hypnos took refuge with his mom, Nyx. This ended up being a great plan, because even the all-powerful Zeus was too scared of Nyx to start any shit with her, so he basically had to give up on his revenge, which is pretty much the only time that ever happens. There's no real analysis to be had here regarding the game, in fact Hypnos even mentions that Nyx never spends time with him, so I guess there's that. It's just a fun story. We will look at one more thing regarding Hypnos in the game though, and that's his appearance. We've already looked at an ancient vase painting and a more modern painting depicting Hypnos, neither of which share any obvious likeness with the Hypnos in Hades, but the one thing I think was a really great but subtle touch was the poppies on his belt. If we actually look back at the painting I just mentioned, you'll notice poppies there too, in his hands and on the wee table in the foreground. 
Hypnos was always associated strongly with the poppy because of its soporific properties, not a surprise at all, and it was also said that the entrance to the cave Hypnos lived in within the underworld was lined with poppies. This is also likely the reason behind his red colour scheme. A really cool detail. As for Thanatos, there is a story regarding him that we'll chat about briefly when we get into the Sisyphus section, but here the main things I want to go into are also aesthetic. Firstly, I want to discuss the big scythe he has. I might be wrong, so let me know if I am, but I don't think there's a single record of Thanatos ever wielding a scythe. If we're talking scythes in Greek mythology, you can't look past the one used by Kronos, Lord of the Titans, which we'll chat about in the next section. However, in this instance, this is obviously meant to be a reference to the Grim Reaper. Nothing to do with Greek myth, but still a sensible choice. The Grim Reaper is another example of a psychopomp, like Charon, and in a way, Thanatos is too. The Grim Reaper and Thanatos are both just personifications of death, so giving in-game Thanatos the weapon most commonly associated with death nowadays is just the obvious thing to do, although it isn't something you'll find ancient precedent for. The other thing I wanted to mention was to do with butterflies. The keepsake he gives you is a butterfly, and I just thought it would be interesting to look into what that represents. The ancient Greek word for butterfly just so happens to be something we've already looked at in this video, and just mentioned a few sentences ago. Psyche, which also means soul. These aren't just accidental homonyms, the connection is intentional, as the ancient Greeks definitely conflated the two and believed that butterflies represented the soul. Psyche was even the name of a character in Greek mythology who, although once mortal, became the goddess of the soul, and was often depicted with butterfly wings. There is even more reference to this idea in-game, as you can see here in the Codex, when you look at the Soul Catcher enemy, which is surrounded by butterflies. Given Thanatos' role as Death Incarnate and potential Psychopomp, associating him with the Soul makes perfect sense. These two gods are tricky to look into, because there are bits and pieces that link to mythology, but like Nyx and Zagreus, most of who they are is modern creative control. However, looking into it a bit deeper, you can tell that Supergiant knew what they were doing and integrated what they could. You need to focus, brother, or it'll be Lord Hades reprimanding you again, and that is not something you want. Oh, I don't know about that. Last time I talked to Master, he made pretty clear he never wanted to speak to me again. Oof, sorry, Hypnos. Similar to how we've looked at Hypnos and Thanatos as a duo, we're going to look at our next set of characters, the Furies, as a trio. That is, I'm going to discuss them as a group, and then look a wee bit at them individually, just like the last entry. So who are the Furies? In the game, they're called Megara, Alecto, and Tisiphone, which is exactly what they're called in mythology. How's that for some incisive analysis? The Furies were essentially the chthonic embodiments of vengeance and retribution, with each of them focusing on punishing a specific transgression, which we'll get into. But you get the idea. Meg even says here that the Furies aren't much for forgiveness or apologies. There's definite overlap here with Nemesis, another goddess who exacts retribution, but their remits are slightly different. I'd also like to just say that although calling them the Furies is totally fine, it's arguably not the most correct word to use. That award would go to the difficult to pronounce Erinyes, which is mentioned a few times in the game actually, as you can see. Furies is a bit easier to say and spell, so there's nothing wrong with Hades using that instead. One other really fascinating euphemism for them was the Eumenides, meaning the Kindly Ones, which definitely seems like a throwback to the alternate names for Hades from earlier. You know, the whole trying not to say the name of the scary god thing. You can see an example of this looking at the title of the third part of the Oresteia, written by Aeschylus. This was a set of plays based upon the story of Orestes, a character from Greek myth who had a famous run-in with the Furies. I won't go into the story fully here, but here is a painting depicting the bit where Orestes kills his mom. Anyway, that name for them isn't used in the game, but it's interesting so I thought it was worth bringing up. Next up is the question of their parentage, which is kind of up for debate. Some ancient sources claim Nyx as their parent, like Ovid and Virgil, but the game sides with the version that I learned as a kid, the much more metal version of the myth. In Tisiphone's Codex entry, it mentions that the Furies came from the spilt blood of the eldest of the Titans. The eldest Titan in question was Uranus, the primordial deity representing the sky. Uranus the sky and Gaia the earth were parents of the first proper generation of Titans, which I guess is why he's referred to here as the eldest of the Titans. One of these Titans was Kronos, who, according to Hesiod's Theogony, 
conspired with his mother Gaia to kill Uranos and take over as ruler. So he took his scythe that I mentioned from when we discussed Thanatos, and with it castrated and thus killed his father. Uranos's blood fell to the ground, and from it emerged the Erinyes, embodiments of vengeance born from patricide. There's another bit of dialogue where Meg references this, saying that she's born of Titan blood. We'll get more into Titans soon, by the way, if you're a bit confused about who exactly they are. Regardless, I'm dead chuffed that the game elected to go with this version of the myth, but not surprised. I feel like despite plenty of other contrasting sources existing, this is generally considered the default version. Anyway, moving on, the design for these three is excellent, and they all look kind of similar. That is, they share certain features, like their one wing, their whips. Obviously, they each have a colour, blue, red, and green, but I'm pretty sure this is just to differentiate them. I don't think there's any literary basis for that. As for their wing, some myths say that they have bat's wings, which is where that comes from, and why Megara's chthonic companion is a bat. I'm not actually sure why they only have one wing each. You can see in this Aeneid translation that it definitely says wings, but if I had to guess, it would be intended to signify incompleteness, perhaps not being at full power. Each sister has one wing, and although they don't initially get on, through Zagreus they come to understand each other a bit better. This also links to the god of blood thing from earlier. So yeah, maybe it's something to signify that they aren't at full power alone and are all stronger together, but to be fair, I'm just making this up, so that could be totally wrong. As for whips, there is actually precedent for this, with there being mentions of them wielding whips in Seneca's Hercules Furens and Nonus's Dionysiaca, both of which you can see on screen at the moment. But to be fair, given that the Furies are supposedly meant to punish and torture wrongdoers, a whip just seems like the sensible choice, precedent or not. My personal favourite piece of appearance-specific info in the game, though, is just an offhand comment from Poseidon, where he calls Megara an old crone, which she very clearly isn't. This is just a tongue-in-cheek reference to what the Furies looked like in most ancient sources, which is pretty much half crony, half demonic and serpentine. We'll bring that up a little bit more when we talk about Tisiphone. So, now we know a bit of background info about the Furies, let's learn a tiny bit about each of them. Megara is one of the major characters in the game, but like a lot of the other Chthonic gods, isn't exactly a household name nowadays. Hearing the name Megara, I think you'd be more likely to think of this character, again from Disney's Hercules. There's a slight spelling difference to differentiate them though. Anyway, the main thing I want to specify when it comes to each Fury sister is just whether what they punish in the game lines up with what they were supposed to punish in the myth. Meg says that she flays Oathbreakers and Liars, and Zagreus, at some point later, adds traitors to that list. This is pretty much dead on. If I had to sum it up in one word, I would say that what Megara focuses on is betrayal. Her name actually has an interesting etymology, and stems from this ancient Greek verb meaning to begrudge or to envy. So there is overlap there with what she focuses on, although I'll be honest, it's much harder to find evidence for what she specifically punishes than for the next two, in my opinion. Next up is Electo, whose we descriptor is Tormentor of Passions, which is basically what the Codex says as well, that she punished people who committed wrongful acts at the behest of their impulsive passions. I found her portrayal in Hades really funny, in a good way, because what she predominantly focuses on punishing is actually crime committed through anger. Her name literally means unceasing in ancient Greek, and it is generally agreed that anger is what is unceasing, like an invisible we extra definition. So she's true to her namesake, because she is easily the most persistently raging and aggressive character in the whole game. There's a slight bit of amusing irony in her punishing the very same thing she exhibits. The Codex also mentions that she's not allowed in the House of Hades because of insubordination long past. As for what that could be referring to, I'm not entirely certain. The only thing that possibly springs to mind is something Electo does in the Aeneid. In Book 7, Juno, the Roman version of Hera, basically asks Electo to help incite a war amongst the Trojans. Virgil describes Electo as really horrible. Even her father Pluto and her hellish sisters hate this monster. So many are her awful forms. And then a few lines later, she does this. Now Electo flung a snake from her black hair. It pierced Amata, then plunged deep into her heart to derange her into ruining her own home. Basically, Electo goes on to do some pretty naughty stuff, and maybe this is what the game is trying to allude to, because the bloodlust that Electo inflicted Amata with was not retribution, but instead the first strike, the very antithesis of what she's supposed to do. 
I have no idea if this is correct and if this is the insubordination she was punished for, but I'm going to see it as canon. Why not? Finally, to Tiffany. Her motivations are the easiest to figure out, considering 99% of what she says is murder or murderer. The origin of her name is just like the other two linked to her duty, but hers is actually a compound word of vengeance and murder. The main thing that differentiates Tiffany though is how much scarier she is than her two sisters, how sunken and inhuman she looks. There isn't really any convincing ancient precedent for this, unfortunately. The closest thing I could find was this mention of Tisiphone from Statius's Thebaid, where he says the cruel goddess turned her grim visage. But that's about it. When you look up the Furies, the most consistent feature you actually seem to come across is them having snakes for hair. It was mentioned in that short passage from the Aeneid we just saw, the one about Alecto, and there's another example on screen here. Greek myth, to be frank, just loves putting snakes on stuff. Think back to Typhon, right at the start of this video, his limbs coiled with snakes. Obviously, the biggest culprits here are the Gorgons, but we'll get to them later on. But yeah, in the actual myth, there's a lot more to Tisiphone than just saying the same two words and looking terrifying. But if I went into absolutely everything about every character, we'd be here forever. So let's just move on to our final Chthonic god, Chaos. Um, hi. Zagreus, no, wait, just the first part. No murderer, just Zagreus. Or, let's see, how about happy? Can you say happy? <laughs> That's not happy. This was a weird one, because writing about chaos is simultaneously the hardest and easiest thing in this entire video. It's easy in the sense that there isn't actually that much to talk about, and difficult in that exact same sense. Chaos is described as the primordial originator, the source of all things, the progenitor of literally everything, and there isn't much more to it than that. For a bit more context, here's another wee snippet from the Noclip documentaries, in which Greg Kasavin and Darren Korb, audio director of Supergiant, discuss chaos. Uh, so I had to trace that all the way back, all the way back down their family tree, and it ends with primordial chaos. There's nothing before that. So it was, it felt really good to be able to take this character, come up with our take on it, and uh, on them, I should say, and, and, and put them in our game. Oh, dang. Oh, she. It's early, but it's, it's pretty, pretty exciting. sweet. Yeah. I'm basically like, oh, it's, it's like super it's messed a, up. It's a, it's a, it's like a Final Fantasy la last boss. <laughs> yeah, it I'm, kind I'm, of I'm, is. I'm down with that. Oh, I'm so down. Yeah, it's gonna be wild, right? Yeah, right. it's gonna, gonna be gonna awesome. Be expecting that. Describing the appearance of Chaos as being a Final Fantasy end boss is pretty hysterical and totally accurate. But how much does Chaos's appearance actually match up with mythological precedent? The answer is, I don't know. I have no idea. I was not able to find more than one shred of evidence that Chaos had ever been personified or given a proper physical description, and as such, it's basically impossible to say. The same goes for modern interpretations too, there's virtually nothing. The only thing that may have even slightly informed the design choice is this section from Ovid's Metamorphoses, when he sort of explains Chaos. He says, It was a rude and undeveloped mass that nothing made except a ponderous weight, and all discordant elements confused were there congested in a shapeless heap." To put it indelicately, Chaos does look pretty batshit, so it's possible that this vague description served as inspiration, but what they ended up coming up with is pretty astounding. Like, cast your mind back to the Nyx section, when I first discussed that primordial deities normally represent a realm. Chaos is one of those who just always stayed as a realm or a concept, in contrast to figures like Gaia, and perhaps even Eros, who have been depicted in art and myth much more frequently. Thus, with Chaos, there's no precedent for their personality, their relationship with Nyx or Zagreus, anything like that. So here, my format kind of falls a bit flat, but there is still one thing that I'd like to discuss, and it's the moment in the game where Zagreus asks Chaos what came before them. Chaos mentions that everything simply came to be, and so did they, presumably after a former time had reached its end. Chaos also mentions later, in reference to what they just said, that perhaps they too had just expired, only to reawaken. What I'm struggling to figure out is, if even just tentatively, this is linked to the trinket that Chaos gives you, the Cosmic Egg. 
Believe it or not, the Cosmic Egg, also known as the World Egg, is an integral part of creation stories and cosmogenies the world over. To really oversimplify it, it's a motif in which an egg, or something egg-like, represents the beginning of a universe, and a primordial being, or something similar, hatches from it, and thus creates the world. I find it weird that Chaos would give you a reference to creation myth that he himself is not part of. Maybe I'm getting this wrong, it isn't something I know too much about, but applying pre-existing creation myths to Chaos, there are two options, and neither are the egg one. The first, based off the myth alone, would imply ex nihilo creation, creation from nothing. Suddenly Chaos just appeared, and there was nothing before him, pretty much like what happens in Genesis, I guess. What Chaos says in the game, however, about a former time reaching its end, or him being reborn, seems to line up mostly with emergence as a creation myth, the idea of, well, emerging from a previous world into the current one. I'm not really sure, but I don't get the link between him and the trinket he gives you. I'm a bit out of my depth here, to be entirely honest. It could totally be the case that there's a link between Chaos from Greek myth and the cosmic egg creation myth that I'm not picking up on. I mean, if you know about this kind of stuff, please let me know in the comments below, I would love to hear a bit more about this. Anyway, let's move on. This section was a bit shorter, but looking at the length of the video, I don't think that's an issue. Now things get a bit easier though, because we're not really dealing with obscure deities anymore. It's time to have a look at the Olympians. Um, have we met? It only seems right to start with Zeus, the king of the Olympians. Zeus was the almighty god of the sky, the fearsome god of thunder, hence the thunderbolts he wields and his cloudy beard, but by all accounts he was not the nicest guy. Hades calls him a blasted little brat at one point, which is probably a good way of summing it up. Zagreus also notes that Zeus acts impulsively at times and deals with the consequences later, which is also the perfect way to describe who he is in mythology, the word impulsive in particular. It seems that nowadays, one of the things most people seem to know about Zeus, the most prevailing fact, is that he was famed for his promiscuity. In myth, you tend to get the impression that his philandering was supposed to be regarded as playful, almost comical. This is because in Greek mythology there is a weird sort of uncomfortable grey area where stories tend to conflate, or perhaps equate, seduction with rape. But this isn't that surprising, considering ancient Greece was a deeply patriarchal society. What a large proportion of these stories come down to is a woman, either mortal or divine, minding her own business when a man, usually divine and usually Zeus, is rendered helpless by her astounding beauty and decides that he must act on that initial impulse, usually against the will of his victim. The story is often framed so that the female figure in question was so entrancing that he just didn't have a choice. Some unfortunate modern day parallels there, don't you think? There are so many examples of this with Zeus that are worth looking into, the stories of Io, Alcmene, Leda, Europa. I mean, Zeus's capture of Europa is on the fucking two euro coin in Greece, which is absolutely mental. You'll get some people who say that the women in these stories were honoured to be courted by the king of the gods, but let's not forget these stories were written by blokes, not just originally, but in translation too, and you can tell. Let's look at a few examples. The main thing worth discussing here is Homer's Odyssey, the classic to end all classics. The Odyssey has been translated a billion times, and every time it was translated again, it was translated by a man. It was 2017 before an English translation of the Odyssey written by a woman was published by classicist Dr. Emily Wilson, and she brings to light some really interesting points about how parts of the story have been historically translated with a definite male bias. Dr. Wilson made an excellent Twitter thread explaining this, which I'll link to in the description, because I'm only going to speak about a small section of it, and it refers to Book 22 of the Odyssey, and specifically the slave woman killed by Telemachus under the orders of Odysseus, his father. She goes on to explain that originally the words used to describe these women were not inherently misogynistic, but almost all translations tend to be so anyway. The Fagels version she mentioned is the first one I ever read, and uses the terms sluts and whores, where there was frankly no need to. That one was only translated in 1996 by the way, it isn't like it's old. And you can see in the other translations too, sluts, creatures, 
all placed there when the original term didn't carry that implication. That was added somewhere along the way, and perpetuated until the original meaning became lost. The other thing she adds is the element of victim blaming that we were just discussing. She mentions that it's portrayed as if it's their own fault they've been killed, despite not doing anything wrong, as if treatment like this is normal, casual even. I'd recommend reading the rest of the thread, because she gives further examples of how the translations victim blame better than I ever could. So I'm just going to move on to one more example of this sort of ingrained misogyny within the mythos, but it isn't to do with Zeus. Instead, it's the story of Apollo and Cassandra, told in Aeschylus' tragedy Agamemnon. The real basics are that Apollo was smitten with a princess named Cassandra, and said he'd give her the gift of prophecy if he could sleep with her. She accepted, but then decided against it. Apollo was furious at being spurned, so he cursed her and made it so that no one would ever believe any of her predictions, despite the truth behind them. The way this story is told and positioned often makes it seem like she's in the wrong, that she deserves the punishment, and this is an upsettingly ubiquitous element of Greek myth. Going back to Hades, Supergiant have done an excellent job of eschewing this pattern of misogyny and instead condemning it. This is how they did it. Throughout the game, you don't find too much misogyny, save for Zeus and Poseidon. Zeus calls Nyx a catch and a concubine, which is funny considering the myth we looked at in the Hypnos section. He also dismisses Aphrodite out of hand in this example on screen, as if she can't handle the situation. We'll learn about this when we get to the Aphrodite section, but Nyx and Aphrodite are, compared to Zeus, elder gods, but to him they are lesser, partly in station, but mostly by way of their gender. However, the manner in which Zeus has been written in the game is that he has absolutely no self-awareness, that he's pretty impetuous, and that although he's in charge, he's not really worth listening to. As Hades said, he's a brat. The point is, Supergiant were really smart about it, and did a bit of much-needed modernization. They made Zeus an oblivious, self-aggrandizing, sexist bigot, which is pretty much the perfect way to portray him, because it makes you treat his mythologically accurate misogynistic outbursts as they should be treated, with nothing but disdain. I suppose even down in the underworld you would have heard such tales of me, young man. They're all untrue, <laughs> except the tales of my bravery. Those are completely accurate, though all too modest in most cases, I must say. So, in preparation for this video, I rewatched my entire playthrough of Hades, over a hundred hours worth, taking notes on the dialogue and things I could discuss when it came to each specific character. I'm not sure how this happened exactly, but I barely wrote anything down for Poseidon, way less than for anyone else. I'm not sure why this is. Maybe it's because a lot of the stuff to do with him ended up being more pertinent to other characters? But what we're actually going to do for this section, on account of exiguous note-taking, is discuss Poseidon a little bit, and then discuss a bit about the Titans, because Poseidon is directly connected to that, although he doesn't personally bring it up much compared to Zeus, so that part will also be a bit of a continuation of the Zeus section. I think I'm overcomplicating things here. Anyway, Poseidon, who is he? He is, as you likely already know, the god of the sea. He is also the god of earthquakes, which is why the Codex calls him the Earthshaker. There is actual precedent for this specific name though. Kind of like the Hades euphemisms, you would also find epithets referring to Poseidon. You can see two of the most common ones on screen, both of which pretty much translate as Earthshaking. He was also called Earthshaker in the Percy Jackson books, so there's similar ground there, but where Hades and Percy Jackson differ is how Poseidon is depicted personality-wise. In the Percy Jackson books, probably the media in which Poseidon has been most prominently featured in recent memory, he is ultimately a nice guy. Still a distant parent, still with unsavoury godlike traits, but all in all, he is very far from being willfully cruel or villainous. Hades understandably paints a less complimentary picture of Poseidon, with Artemis calling him a big fat oaf, and Chaos calling him boastful and belligerent. There's a lot in common with Zeus and Poseidon, both in the game and in the mythology, so it's no surprise to have them both portrayed like this. Although it's not strictly accurate, if you want to get a grasp of what Poseidon was like in mythology, try to think of him as being like, Diet Zeus. That's one of the easiest ways to get the idea into your head. For example, we had the list in the last section with Io, Europa, and so on, and it's pretty easy to do one of those lists for Poseidon too, and a lot of other gods to be fair, but you get the point. Again, the Codex says that Hades equates the two of them, and they are both proud, impulsive, and pretty pig-headed, so I think that's a pretty legit reading. Design-wise, Poseidon looks excellent, as all the characters do. He looks nothing like Zeus really, but they share features like their godhood manifesting in their hair and beards, which is pretty cool. He's covered in wave and shell kind of patterns to reference the sea, obviously. But the most interesting of these oceanic elements is easily the horse-slash-seahorse crown he wears. 
again, something you'll know if you've read the Percy Jackson books that seems a bit weird if you only know that Poseidon is the god of the sea, is that he is also the god of horses. Now, pinning down myths around this topic is actually quite difficult, despite the fact that there are loads of references to horses being connected to Poseidon in mythology. It's just that there is often a bit of disagreement when it comes to the details. For example, a really famous myth featuring Poseidon centres around Athens, and which god would become patron of the city. It was Poseidon and Athena who were vying for patronage, and from the name of Athens you can tell who won. Basically, they both presented a gift to the city, and whoever's gift was deemed most useful was the winner. Athena invented the olive tree as a gift, and depending on the version of the myth, Poseidon either created a saltwater spring in the town, which wasn't useful because it was salty water, or created the horse. In other stories, he directly fathers horses, as opposed to inventing them, and these included the famous steeds Arion and Pegasus, although Pegasus was actually a bit more indirect, as we'll see when we talk about Medusa later. As a little tangent, if you've ever seen Disney's Hercules, which we've already mentioned twice, you'll know that Hercules rode Pegasus, but that actually has next to no mythological precedent. Pegasus was actually predominantly associated with another Greek hero, called Bellerophon. But anyway, there's more to Poseidon and horses, but we'll stop there. Let's move on to a topic that gets brought up a lot in Hades, but never really gets explained. The Titans. We're going to get a grasp of the basics here, but not go into too much detail. It's just nice to have a bit more context surrounding the events of, and the characters in, the game. So, in the Titan-specific dialogue you'll find in-game, you'll get moments where Zeus brings up that he and his brothers prevailed in a war against the Titans. Hades actually brings it up too, but credits his sisters, unlike Zeus. Typical. Titan blood as an item also plays a role in the game, and the Codex mentions that the Titans once ruled all between heaven and earth, but they were dispatched by their offspring, the Olympians. This gives you an idea of what happened, but it's going to be made a bit easier if we look at a family tree quickly. We've mentioned Gaia and Uranus already in the earlier sections, the primordial gods representing the earth and the sky. They had 12 children, called the Titans, but don't get too caught up in the name and start thinking that they were different to the gods because they weren't really that different, they were just a set of gods that came before the Olympians. If you remember from when we discussed the Furies, one of these children, Kronos, conspired with his mom to kill his dad, and thus came the Age of the Titans. It was a simple transfer of power. As you can see from the diagram, Kronos and his sister Rhea went on to have six children, three of whom we've already looked at. However, it had been prophesied that just as Uranus had been deposed by his own child, so would Kronos be deposed by his own, and as such, he took to an unusual habit, eating his kids. There's a good chance you've seen the Goya painting depicting this. Really what he did was swallow them whole, according to Hesiod's Theogony. It would have been a bit grim even for Greek myth for him to properly chew on his babies, but he thought that if he did this, his power would be secure. That is, until child number six, Zeus. Rhea fooled Kronos by feeding him a swaddled rock instead of a child. It's mad to think he didn't notice this, but this is another really iconic scene, as you can see in these ancient urn paintings and carvings. This stone was later known as the Omphalos Stone, and was eventually placed at Delphi, believed in ancient Greece to be the centre of the world. Although more importantly, it became a major plot point in God of War 3. That bit was pretty good. Anyway, Zeus was raised in secret, maybe by a goat called Amalthea, maybe not. I'll let you look that up yourself. Eventually, he came back, confronted Kronos, made him regurgitate all his kids, who were now fully grown because they were immortal, and this helped instigate the Titanomachy, a decade-long war for power. The younger generation won, disposed of the Titans in Tartarus, and started fixing up the place. What Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades decided to do after that was draw lots to decide who had jurisdiction over what. This is mentioned in the game by both Zeus and Zagreus. Zeus says that Hades got the short end of the stick, which sounds more like a metaphor, but it's actually pretty literal. Zagreus also says that they drew lots, which, considering the importance of the situation, seems a bit hasty. Anyway, I'm sorry for going on for so long, but this is how Zeus ended up with dominion over the sky, Hades with dominion over the underworld, and Poseidon with dominion over the sea. And with that, let's finally move on. I dare say, little Hades, you have some spunk in you. Why, I think you take after me more than my trusty older brother. We'll get away from that old Carter yet. Now we'll have a wee chat about Athena. Athena is most well known as being the goddess of wisdom, but she's also the goddess of other things, such as crafts, which included things like weaving and pottery, but most notably, she was also the goddess of warfare. 
You might be thinking, if you've played the game or know a bit about mythology, that Ares was the god of warfare, not Athena. The actual answer is that they are both war gods, but Ares is a bit more infamous. One way to explain it is that they both represent different elements of war. Ares representing bloodlust and slaughter, and the wise Athena representing strategy and tactics. Looking at Homer's Iliad quickly, here's a moment that illustrates this difference in personality quite nicely, focusing on Ares. The Iliad basically deals with the Trojan War, and in this war, Ares eventually starts helping out the Trojans, directly having a hand in the war effort. The Trojans drove the strength of their hands straight on, as violent Ares, defending the Trojans, mantled in dark night the battle, and passed everywhere. Athena also plays a role in the Iliad, both hands-on and tactically, but is arguably best known for assisting in the creation of the Trojan Horse, the means by which the Greeks infiltrated Troy under the guise of a gift. The Aeneid is actually more explicit about this than the Iliad, although they are discussing the same topic, so here's a quote from the Aeneid. After many years have slipped by, the leaders of the Greeks, opposed by the fates and damaged by the war, build a horse of mountainous size, through Pallas's divine art. So that's pretty cool. Keeping that quote in mind though, I was pretty excited to see the game reference the term Pallas to refer to Athena. Achilles uses it in the Codex to describe her, and the way it's written, Pallas Athena, is a remarkably common way of referring to her. I might be wrong, but I think the only mention of it is in the Codex. Regardless, it's a really cool detail. Where does it come from though? Why does Achilles call her that? It turns out that's a complex question to answer, because there are plenty of potential reasons. Firstly, the epithet could be based on the ancient Greek verb palo, which I'm sure I've said wrong again. Look at the Wiktionary definitions for this. The first one is where the epithet may stem from, with her being a goddess of warfare, but if you've played Hades, you'll know not to disregard the importance of an Athena dash. This would maybe seem like convincing reasoning though, if not for the name Pallas turning up loads of other times too. Some myths make Pallas a childhood friend of Athena, who died while they were sparring, and Athena took up her name as a sign of respect and grief. In other myths, Athena defeats a giant called Pallas and flays his skin off to make a cloak. The point is, I'm not sure what's right. And there are even more options that I haven't mentioned, but ultimately I just think it's cool that it was mentioned in the game at all. I would like to go back to look at the cloak I just mentioned though, although how I get there might seem a bit indirect, because what I want to do now is quickly discuss Athena's appearance. The main thing to note is that Athena is fully armoured, standing proudly. Interestingly, she was born fully grown and fully armoured, which is a fun wee story. I'll let you look into the details more yourself if you want, but the basics are that Zeus had a headache, Hephaestus split his head open with an axe, and Athena popped out of his skull ready to go. The game does mention this, Demeter brings it up directly in a put down to Zeus, and Athena also alludes to her birth being unusual, saying she was born and raised under the strangest circumstances. Anyway, there are two other elements to her appearance that are noteworthy, the first being the owl she's carrying. We've mentioned Pallas, but another epithet commonly attributed to Athena, especially in the epics of Homer, was Glaucopus, meaning something like bright-eyed. What's interesting about that though is the link between the epithet and an ancient Greek word for owl, which is as you can see on screen. Specifically, this refers to the little owl, which was historically associated with Athena. You can even see owls being associated with Athena on this Athenian coin, also featuring an olive branch, which ties into the Poseidon versus Athena story from the last section. Really, the question here is whether owls are considered a symbol of wisdom due to their association with Athena, or whether owls were always considered wise and as such were associated with Athena. I'm not really sure which it is, but ultimately it doesn't really matter. The point is that the game has depicted her with an owl, and very often in ancient art and myth she is depicted with an owl, so Supergiant have done as well as they could there. The final thing I wanted to mention was her shield, which again you'll recognise as being the wee icon thing that represents her in the game, just like Zeus has the lightning bolt and Poseidon has the trident. Given what we know about Athena, that she's the goddess of military strategy and forethought, it's not surprising that she would wield a shield, a defensive piece of equipment. Believe it or not, this is where we link back to her cloak from earlier, I told you it would be indirect. Alongside the owl, the main piece of iconography you would attribute to Athena would be the Aegis, her shield. It's worth at least briefly discussing the appearance of the shield, which in the game is quite nondescript compared to some mythological accounts. Virgil says the shield has golden serpent scales, and the shield Athena wields in game is gold, and then goes off-piste and says that the shield features a headless gorgon, still too grim to look at. This was maybe the most common appearance for the Aegis, having a gorgon head depicted on it. 
but depending on the source in question, the Aegis wasn't even necessarily a shield. It could also be a protective cloak, maybe one fashioned from the skin of a goat, or in some stories, the skin of a giant. Look at these two artworks, for example. This sculpture of Athena features something cloak-like wrapped around her, with a gorgon head on it. This next one isn't of Athena, but Alexander the Great, with his armour also featuring a gorgon head. I'm not trying to say all depictions of the Aegis have these faces on, it was just a very common concept. Personally, I'm totally cool with Athena's shield being more simple, because the game didn't totally give up on the idea of having a terrifying face on a version of the Aegis, as we'll see later. But yeah, I think the game did an excellent job with Athena. Again, I've not said everything there is to be said about her, not even a fraction to be honest, but she's really fascinating both in the game and in the myths. So it's really satisfying to see Supergiant do her justice. I have a simple token for you, Goddess, although it's insufficient thanks for all the aid you've given me. You are most gracious, cousin, to extend this offering. You honor me, yet I would ask you think of your well-being for the time, not mine. Next up we have Aphrodite, who, unsurprisingly, is pretty different to Athena. You can tell from this dialogue here that they do not get on. This makes sense though, where Athena is reserved, Aphrodite isn't. She's the goddess representing love, beauty, passion, sex, all that kind of stuff. This is, to a degree, why she's naked. Obviously in-game there's jewellery and conveniently placed locks of hair, but it actually makes sense for Aphrodite not to be wearing anything, because that is how she was most commonly portrayed in art and sculpture. Part of the reason for this is because of the sculpture you can see now. This is the Aphrodite of Nidos, fashioned by the Athenian sculptor Praxiteles. The cultural impact this sculpture had was enormous. Believe it or not, this set a trend for nude sculpture of the female form, as most nude sculpture up to this point depicted men. I would argue that the two most famous pieces of art depicting Aphrodite are these two. Firstly, the Venus de Milo, created about two centuries after the Aphrodite of Nidos, and secondly, Botticelli's The Birth of Venus which was painted over 17 centuries after the Aphrodite of Nidos. And for the eagle-eyed amongst you, you may have noticed the similarity of hand positions between the two in the Botticelli piece. Not identical, but there's no doubt some influence here, and this influence extends to Hades too, which is really cool. Going back to Botticelli for a second though, it's worth looking at what this painting actually supposedly depicts, the birth of Venus. By the way, just in case anyone isn't sure, Venus is just the Roman name for Aphrodite, they're ostensibly the same. Back when we discussed the Furies, we chatted about how they were born, with the blood from Uranus's freshly severed genitals hitting the ground. And also when we discussed Zeus, I brought up that Aphrodite was an elder god compared to him. So how was Aphrodite born? According to multiple sources, from Hesiod to Ovid to Nonus, she was born when Uranus's ball sack was chucked into the sea. The sea around it began to foam, and from that sea foam, Aphrodite emerged. The painting we've just been talking about actually depicts the moment where she arrives on land after popping out from the foam, if you're interested. The point is though, that if you take Hesiod's word for it, Aphrodite is the eldest Olympian, comfortably predating any of the others. I think that the game actually references Aphrodite's birth when she mentions knowing a thing or two about Megara, given that they were born at pretty much the same time from pretty much the same source, but then again it could also just be a hint towards Zagreus and Megara having feelings for each other. As far as I know, Aphrodite's birth isn't mentioned anywhere else in the game, although I definitely could have missed something. But on top of that, the game does call Demeter the eldest Olympian, which we'll get to when we reach her section, so I think Supergiant just elected to omit any blatant references to Aphrodite's birth, so that there wouldn't be any undue confusion on that front, no crossing wires from a narrative perspective. Personality-wise, Aphrodite is interesting. She is charming, sultry, speaks mellifluously, and simultaneously is capricious, cruel, and a bit sadistic. In the Codex, Achilles calls her handiwork not as pretty as she is, saying her power is the most terrible in all the world. You see this a bit when you reject her in those rooms where you have to pick one of the gods first, but this video is about mythological precedent. Is there any? Unsurprisingly, yes there is. The Trojan War is probably the best example you'll find of Aphrodite's nastier side. There are plenty of moments in it we could discuss, but what we'll actually chat about here is that you could argue that the Trojan War only happened because of her. These are the basics. Paris, a Trojan prince, was forced into a situation where he had to decide which goddess was most beautiful between Hera, Athena, and Aphrodite. To make things worse for him, he had to decide this in front of them, which would be pretty scary. They all attempted to sway his choice by offering him things. Hera offered him power, 
Athena offered him military glory, and Aphrodite offered him the love of the most beautiful woman in the world, who happened to be a certain someone called Helen, the Queen of Sparta, later known as Helen of Troy. Unsurprisingly, he thought with his dick, chose Aphrodite, and went off to get Helen. The nature of how he seduced Helen is, as we chatted about in the Zeus section, ambiguous at best, but the poet Sappho, in the few lines that you can see on screen, claims that Helen willingly left her family to go to Troy with Paris. The Greeks were mad that the Trojans stole Helen, and thus started the Trojan War. I know that was still quite a lot, but that's the basics of the situation, and I mean the real abridged basics. The point here was that arguably the most famous war in Greek myth was actually instigated because of love and desire, and ultimately Aphrodite's need to beat her competition, regardless of the consequences. One last thing, kind of relating to Aphrodite, that was brought up briefly in the game is the seven types of love. Aphrodite herself mentions it to you, and later on Zagreus brings it up again. What this is referring to is the idea that ancient Greek had multiple words for love, and all of them slightly differ in definition. Here are the ones I've found, more than seven, and if you've played Final Fantasy XIV Shadowbringers, you might recognise a few of these terms. As a concept, I had never specifically heard of there being seven types of love, and I'm not entirely sure it's an established idea like the game makes it out to be. The closest thing to a theory involving these that I found was this love colour wheel, made by Canadian psychologist John Allen Lee in 1973. This only has six types, or nine, depending how you look at it, and the list I had up earlier had eight types, so I'm not really sure what's going on. Nonetheless, it's pretty interesting to look into this, and see how it links into the overarching narrative of the game. We talked about Zagreus being the god of blood, of relationships, and I think that plays into this idea. You'll find a few of these different kinds of love portrayed in the game, and even though there might not be a set seven types of love taught in the underworld, I think it's nonetheless a fun addition to world building in Hades. And with that, let's see who's up next. How you must yearn to reach the surface, little goblin. It likewise stirs in me a yearning to assist you by all means at my disposal. Now it's time to have a look at Artemis, goddess of the hunt and protector of the wild. Like Athena before her, and like the next three gods we'll discuss, Artemis is a child of Zeus, and she's also a twin. Her brother Apollo plays a pretty big role in Greek myth, but didn't quite make the cut for this game, so it's pretty interesting seeing Artemis without him. It would have been interesting to have their personalities play off each other, because where Apollo is brash and ostentatious, Artemis is, for a deity at least, reticent and withdrawn. The Codex mentions Artemis's ambivalence towards human admiration, and her commitment to her role as a master of the natural world and she herself brings up that even despite being around her family, she always felt alone. There is ancient precedent for this idea, kind of. The Greek poet Callimachus wrote a hymn to Artemis, in which he says this in describing her duties. For seldom is it that Artemis goes down to the town. On the mountains will I dwell, and the cities of men I will visit only when women vexed by the sharp pang of childbirth call me to their aid. Here you can see that she doesn't get too involved with the affairs of people, but does get involved with childbirth, which is pretty interesting, and a smidge ironic perhaps, because Artemis is probably the most famous example of a virgin goddess. This is kind of referenced in the game, however when I was going through the footage taking notes, this is the one instance in which I wrote a note about the relevant piece of dialogue and forgot to write the timestamp, so you're gonna have to take my word for it that at one point in the game Poseidon tells Artemis that she won't easily attract a mate with such a sour look about her. This is funny dialogue if you know that Artemis is a virgin goddess, mostly because it plays into what we discussed about Poseidon being an absolute muppet. There is also reference to Athena being a virgin goddess, which she is, when Poseidon mentions that she's childless, as you can see here. I've always found the virgin goddess thing a bit strange, because I can't think of a male god who has been afforded that trait as a defining part of their personality, and when you think of the main female deities in the Greek pantheon, a lot of them have been constrained, shall we say. Artemis, Athena, and Hestia are all virgin goddesses. Hera isn't, but being the goddess of marriage, she only has children with Zeus, a concept that he does not reciprocate. Interestingly, you might recognise the phrase Vestal Virgins, either from use in pop culture, or from being in the second verse of Procol Harum's best known song, A Whiter Shade of Pale. Vesta was actually the Roman equivalent of Hestia, whose followers had to abide by a strict oath of chastity. That's where the phrase comes from. Why I bring that up is because it was pretty much the same with Artemis and her followers. Part of Artemis's remit, alongside hunting and all that, was that she was also the goddess and protector of young girls and women, and as such she had a retinue of followers, almost all maidens or nymphs, who had to abide by her rules of chastity, or face punishment, even if it wasn't their fault. 
enter who else but Zeus. Artemis makes reference to only one member of her mythological gang by name during her dialogue in Hades, and the person in question is Callisto. Artemis mentions her on a few separate occasions, but the first time she says that Callisto is a woodland nymph who goes hunting with her. A nymph, by the way, is just a very minor female deity associated with some aspect of nature. We'll chat more about them later. Anyway, Callisto. After mentioning her a few times, Artemis drops the fact that she can turn into a bear. This is a more light-hearted adaptation of the actual myth surrounding Artemis and Callisto, in which Zeus seduces Callisto, and when Artemis discovers that she is pregnant, changed her into a bear, and depending on the story, either exiled her or killed her. Either way, it ended badly for her, and according to Hesiod, Zeus took pity on her at the end and put her amongst the stars. This was meant to explain the constellation of Ursa Major, Ursa of course being the Latin for bear. This next bit isn't actually linked to Artemis at all, but it's interesting so I'll be quick. Callisto is also the name of one of the four primary moons of the planet Jupiter, which is named after Zeus's Roman aspect. The other three are Io and Europa, who we mentioned briefly in the Zeus section, and Ganymede, who we haven't discussed at all and won't really, although his story is pretty interesting. I've just always found it fascinating that these four moons circling Jupiter were all named for mythological figures that Zeus took a liking for, to put it nicely. Just a cool wee fact. There's one more thing to discuss Artemis-wise, and it's a piece of iconography you can see over her design, on her chest and headpiece specifically, and that is the moon. Artemis and Apollo both took quite a lot on when it came to what they presided over, and that included being gods of the moon and the sun, respectively. This seems to make sense, and to be fair, it, it does. I mean, a set of twins with one being the sun, one being the moon, it works out. But if you know a bit about mythology, you might have heard about gods called Helios and Selene, who are also gods of the sun and the moon. What's going on here, and why are there two of each? The game mentions Helios, directly calling him the sun, but as far as I know, never mentions Selene, who would be the moon. Like Artemis and Apollo, Helios and Selene are also siblings, the children of the titans Hyperion and Thea. What do you think Hyperion was god of? You guessed it, the sun. With that, we have three sun gods, and two moon goddesses, which seems a bit silly. How can Artemis be the goddess of the moon, when there is already another goddess of the moon? Apparently, it comes down to a slight difference in definition for those two. The way to look at Selene is that she is the personification of the moon, whereas Artemis was just associated with the moon. However, it's still all a bit hazy. The ancient Greek geographer Strabo said that both Helios, the sun, and Selene, the moon, are closely associated with these, these referring to Apollo and Artemis, since they are the causes of the temperature in the air. And in saying this, he seems to conflate them. This is a really tricky one to deal with because it's really hard to get a conclusive answer, but it kind of boils down to mythology changing over time. In Roman myth, there seems to be more overlap between Luna, the syncretic equivalent of Selene, and Diana, the syncretic equivalent of Artemis, than in the Greek pantheon. Gods would often blend into one another as centuries passed and stories changed, and I would hazard a guess that this is what happened here. Selene was the moon originally, and over time people would associate Artemis with the moon too. Then eventually, people would either forget Selene or conflate the two, and by the time we reach the Romans, it's all starting to change yet again. According to Cicero, the big man himself, people regard Diana and the moon as one and the same in Rome. It feels weird to end a section without really having made a conclusive point that draws everything together, but sometimes mythology just doesn't work like that. Artemis is the goddess of the moon, but she isn't the moon, although she is eventually. That's just how it goes. To you arrive here, Zagreus. Then I will probably ignore you like the rest. Just warning you ahead of time, all right? Next we have Ares, the god of war. We've already had a chat about his half-sister Athena, and to get an idea of who Ares is, it's worth checking her codex entry. Achilles writes that he would like to think her efforts keep the violent lusting of Ares well in check. As I mentioned back in that earlier section, Athena represents the more strategic elements of warfare, and Ares is all about the violence. The game gets this dead on, and writes Ares to be almost concerningly sadistic. He tells Zagreus that he looks forward to the pain he shall inflict this time around, and Athena tells you that she has always found his conduct quite disturbing. This has some really specific mythological precedent. This line in the Iliad, where Athena says this of Ares. Violent Ares, that thing of fury, evil wrought, that double-faced liar. 
But to be honest, there isn't too much more to Ares as a character than that. He represents a more violent, less inhibited side of the human condition, and the game shows him as being exactly that. I'm not meaning to be reductive, he just isn't that complex, and myths surrounding him tend to either focus on him being violent, like the game shows, or him being humiliated, which we'll discuss later. For now though, I'd like to chat about his appearance, because there's a few things here worth mentioning. First things first, his helmet. Throughout ancient Greek history, soldiers wore a few different kinds of helmet, as you can see. The one that Ares is carrying seems most similar to a Corinthian helmet. The one depicted in his design isn't plumed, but you can see that often in ancient art it was, and in artworks depicting Ares specifically, this statue for instance, you can see that it does look like a Corinthian helmet, but with a plume. As for why his helmet doesn't have a plume in the game, I'd hazard a guess that it would have been a nightmare to draw if he was holding it under his arm. Either way, I don't think it matters. The fact that it's a Corinthian helmet is a cool enough detail, especially considering its link to the Spartans. According to the greatest source in the world, Wikipedia, the Spartans would often wear the Corinthian helmet, until they changed their mind and started wearing this pointy monstrosity. I'm not saying that it's entirely accurate, but the 2006 film 300 is probably the piece of media surrounding Sparta that has had the largest recent cultural impact, and you can see them wearing these helmets in the film. Why this perhaps matters is simply that there's a connection in myth between Ares and Sparta. In contrast to most Greek societies, where he wasn't the most popular god, Ares was supposedly venerated by the warlike Spartans. Most of the evidence for this comes from the accounts of the ancient geographer Pausanias, who said this in reference to Ares. And at Sparta, where there was an ancient statue representing the god in chains to indicate that the martial spirit and victory were never to leave the city of Sparta. I think the chances are that Ares in the game has that specific helmet simply because he's often depicted with it in ancient art, but his connection to Sparta is nonetheless interesting, and I think it's fun to open up the possibility that he has this helmet in the game as a little nod to that element of his history. The other thing about his appearance that I found really fascinating was the avian iconography. It's hard to avoid the enormous bird skull on his chest, and I'm pretty sure that it's meant to be the skull of a vulture. If you have a look at one here, I think there's a definite similarity and there would be the tiniest degree of precedent for it. Given that vultures are scavenging birds, they were supposedly strongly associated with Ares, the war god doing his utmost to leave a slew of bodies on the battlefield. You'll find loads of stuff online saying that vultures and Ares were linked, but I've actually found it really difficult to pin down some sort of original ancient source that explicitly says that, so I'm not too sure. Usually I try to back up pretty much everything I'm saying, as I'm sure you've noticed, but I'm not finding anything for this apart from an obscure story where Ares and Hermes turn someone into a vulture. There is one more bird related thing I noticed regarding his design, although I'm not certain that it's actually a reference to what I'm going to bring up. I think that the spikes coming off his pauldrons may be a reference to the Ornithes Arioi, also known as the Birds of Ares, birds made of metal that guarded a shrine to Ares. The Argonauts came across them during their quest to find the Golden Fleece. Sometimes these birds are conflated with the Stymphalian birds, man-eating birds that Heracles, or Hercules, had to defeat as part of his twelve labours. The point is that the feathers of these birds were made of metal and could be shot like arrows. Apollonius of Rhodes talks about this in his epic poem The Argonautica. They suddenly beheld the war god's birds, which haunt the island, darting through the air. Flapping its wings over the moving ship, it dropped a pointed feather down upon her. The plume struck the left shoulder of noble Oileus, who let his oar fall at the sudden blow, while the rest looked in amazement at the winged dart. Basically, I think there's a chance that this myth influenced his design, or at least I hope it did. One last thing to talk about regarding Ares, and it's as much to do with Aphrodite as it is him. You'll notice in Hades that when the Olympian gods speak to one another, 90% of the time they're not nice to each other. Almost every quote I've brought up from them in this whole video has been at least one of them being horrible. The weird exception to this rule is Ares and Aphrodite, who get a fair amount of dialogue together. Here you can see Ares saying love and death together hand in hand sounds most agreeable to him, and you also get to see them discussing the idea that love and war, although it sounds surprising, also go hand in hand, to which Ares adds that they are both passions, so it makes sense. I love the dialogue between them, because it's a really clear reference to the fact that Ares and Aphrodite had arguably the most famous long-standing affair in the entirety of Greek myth. Aphrodite was married to the god Hephaestus, which she wasn't best pleased about. 
I really wish Hephaestus was in the game, by the way. It would have been really nice to have a bit of disability representation, and it could have been a pretty cool alternative to the upgrade system with the Daedalus hammers. Anyway, Aphrodite mentions in the game that she's married, and that her husband is always busy, which gives her plenty of time to hang out with Ares. Earlier I mentioned that Ares quite often got humiliated in Greek myth, and this is the prime example of that. Hephaestus was wise to what Aphrodite was doing, because he'd been informed by Helios, the sun god we mentioned in the last section. So, being the god of blacksmithing and metalworking, he created a net to catch them. Ovid's take on the story is probably the best. At once he forged a net, a mesh of thinnest links of bronze, too fine for eye to see, a triumph not surpassed by finest threads of silk, or by the web the spider hands below the rafter's beam. He fashioned it to respond to the least touch or slightest movement, then with subtle skill arranged it round the bed. So when his wife lay down together with her paramour, her husband's mesh, so cleverly contrived, secured them both and snared as they embraced. Straightway Hephaestus flung wide the ivory doors and ushered in the gods. The two lay there, snarled in their shame. So yeah, there's definite subtext in the game that alludes to this famous tryst, so I'm proper pleased they added that. That's us done for Ares now though. Now to Dionysus. Know that I admire your lord father very much, for his grim work lets me continue mine. I trust that one day you shall settle your dispute. Dionysus is the god of wine. You might remember when we chatted about Zagreus near the beginning that I said that some of this section would end up being Zagreus Part 2. There is still some stuff to say about Dionysus, but after that we will be chatting about Zagreus. Hopefully it will make sense why when we get there. First off, I'd like to look at his appearance. Like most of the characters, there are often little clues and references to their mythological background in their design, and with Dionysus there are two worth mentioning. Obviously the grapes and wine are pretty self-explanatory, so I'm not going to bother with those. The first thing is the leopard pelt that he has draped around his shoulders. Often when you see ancient art of Dionysus he'll be accompanied by a leopard or a panther. Sometimes, as you can see, he even rides them. There is ancient reference to this association with the animal. Back to Ovid, as usual, he says this referring to Dionysus. And at his feet fierce spotted panthers lay, tigers and lynxes too, in phantom forms. I'm not actually sure why leopards and big cats are so strongly associated with Dionysus. It's likely there's a source somewhere that elucidates that, but I don't know it. My personal theory is that it's because they're pretty dangerous wild animals. Alongside being the god of wine, Dionysus is also the god of madness, which is actually mentioned in the Codex. Therefore, I think it would make sense that he would have a way with the untamable. Either way, it's a neat detail. The other thing that's a neat detail is the staff he's holding, that has a pine cone on the top. This is a vital piece of iconography when it comes to Dionysus and Bacchus, his Roman equivalent, and it's called a thyrsus. Again, like the leopard skin, you can find myriad ancient artworks in which he's depicted with this thyrsus. As for what it represented, let's look at it this way. Dionysus was the god of wine and madness, so it's no surprise that he had some pretty interesting followers. There were cults that worshipped Dionysus, and they got up to some pretty crazy stuff, a lot of it of a sexual nature. It's generally agreed that the thyrsus is meant to be phallic, and represent fertility. The pinecone bit in particular, obviously. An additional bit of dialogue with Dionysus in the game mentions that the satyrs you fight aren't like his crew, which refers to the fact that satyrs and Dionysus are also inextricably linked in myth. Satyrs are basically male nature spirits, like nymphs, but more degenerate. I won't really go into it here, but satyrs were essentially sexual deviants, and an intrinsic element of cult worship of Dionysus. The point is, there's more of a link between sex and Dionysus than it might initially seem, but that might not be too much of a surprise. Depends on what you expect from the god of wine, really. One tiny thing left to discuss, and that's the story of Dionysus' birth. The Codex mentions that he has mortal blood in him, so let's look into that. In the story this is referring to, Dionysus' mother was a woman called Semele, who was indeed mortal. Her mortality is actually the crux of the story. Zeus was quite taken by Semele, unsurprisingly, and got her pregnant. Hera, Zeus's wife, disguised herself and told Semele that the person who got her pregnant was Zeus himself. Semele confronted Zeus about this and made him promise that he would prove who he really was. In Greek myths, gods have a true form, which mortals cannot witness without disintegrating, and Zeus revealed this true form to the pregnant Semele, and she died. 
Zeus then somehow retrieved the yet unborn Dionysus from her corpse, ashes, whatever, and then sewed the fetus into his thigh. A few months later, who pops out but Dionysus? Greek mythology is very strange, but this is a pretty interesting story, so I thought it worth telling. Also, talking about the birth of Dionysus segues nicely into us starting to talk more about Zagreus again. According to some schools of thought within ancient Greek myth, the birth we've just discussed is actually the second time that Dionysus is born. I'll be honest, this is all pretty complicated, so I'm going to simplify it as much as possible by saying that the first Dionysus was actually Zagreus. In the game, there are a few moments when Dionysus and Zagreus decide to prank Orpheus, by telling him that they are actually the same god, the same person. Orpheus believes this, and writes a song about it. This is a really cool detail that Supergiant put into Hades because the set of myths in which this story belongs is the Orphic myths. Orphism was a set of beliefs informed by the writings of Orpheus, who we'll chat about more later on, and this belief system pretty much centred around the idea of this first Dionysus, the Dionysus Zagreus, being killed and reborn. So, what I'm going to try and do here is look at some of the key lyrics in the song that Orpheus writes in the game, which is called The Hymn to Zagreus and see what lines up with the ancient myths on this. So here we have two wee verses. Dionysus Zagreus was indeed born of Zeus, and Persephone, interestingly, so she's still his mum in this version of the story too. As a serpent refers to the fact that Zeus had transformed himself into a snake to seduce Persephone, which apparently worked somehow. In spite of Queen Hera is the same thing we're used to hearing. Hera was mad at Zeus for cheating, and tried successfully to have the baby Dionysus Sagrius killed by the Titans, as you can see in Torn to Shreds. This part is actually the most important that he was torn apart. There's a word for this, sparagmos, literally referring to the act of something being ripped apart or dismembered, specifically in this kind of context too. This verse refers to Zeus obliterating the Titans after they have murdered, and in some accounts, eaten his child. According to some sources, Athena was able to recover Dionysus Sagrius' heart and his heart was used to revive Dionysus into his more recognisable form. Zagreus actually says this exact thing in the game. This is literally the most simple way to talk about it that I can think of. There is more to it, but I don't think it's worth going into because it gets a bit silly. All this is really trying to say is that in some versions of Greek myth, the name Zagreus was sometimes conflated with this proto-Dionysus, and I think what Hades does so well is reference how niche and esoteric and tricky to follow the whole thing is. After you prank Orpheus in the game and actually speak to Dionysus himself, he says, he's got this entire ballad now about how you are really me, or maybe it's the other way around, I have no idea, which I find really funny because it's so self-aware from a writing perspective. Canonically in the game, Zagreus and Dionysus just made up the most mental shit they could, and the game has used that as a basis to try and explain how bizarre some of the Orphic myths are. It's complicated, but this is one of the best examples in the whole game of integrating an obscure aspect of mythology into the narrative. It's incredible stuff. Hey Zag, ever see a fellow by the name of Orpheus down there? You ever heard of him? I bet you have. And I have had a funny thought, a little jest that maybe we could try if you'd be up to have a little harmless fun. Harmless fun at the expense of Orpheus? You have my full and complete attention, Dionysus mate. Up next, we have Hermes, the penultimate Olympian on our list. His descriptor is God of Swiftness, which is an interesting one, because he can move very quickly. But as far as I know, he isn't the God of Swiftness like Poseidon is the God of the Sea, if that makes any sense. The Codex calls him Patron to Travellers, Traders, and Tricksters, which is a bit more accurate, but to be fair, Hermes is the God of a lot of stuff. But more commonly known than any of that stuff is his job, which is being the messenger of the gods. Let's look at his design and see if we can glean any fun bits of information out of it. Being the messenger of the gods, it's no surprise that he's got a wee bag of mail ready for delivery, and if you look really closely, you can actually spot the head of a tortoise poking out from amongst the letters and scrolls. This might seem like a funny tortoise in the hare kind of reference, with him being really quick and having a really slow animal as a pet or something, but it's actually most likely a reference to a myth regarding Hermes as a baby. The Homeric Hymn to Hermes, alongside being a cracking bit of alliteration, is the best source of info regarding his early life. It turns out he was a pretty precocious baby, and shortly after being born, came across a tortoise, and according to our sources, took up the tortoise in both hands and went back into the house carrying his charming toy. Then he cut off its limbs and scooped out the marrow of the mountain tortoise with a scoop of grey iron. 
This is pretty grim, but we aren't quite done yet. He cut stalks of reed to measure and fixed them, fastening their ends across the back and through the shell of the tortoise, and then stretched oxhide all over it by his skill. Also, he put in the horns and fitted a cross piece upon the two of them, and stretched seven strings of sheep gut. You may have figured out that what Hermes is doing here is creating an instrument. This is the origin story for the lyre, but more specifically for the kelis, an ancient lyre which was often made using tortoise shell. And that word also actually means tortoise in ancient Greek, interestingly enough. Pretty literal way of naming the instrument. As for instruments in Hades, Orpheus is the court musician and plays the lyre. Hermes actually has a little bit of dialogue where he mentions that Orpheus is pretty decent with that lyre of his. I don't know if this is some sort of reference to Hermes having created it, but no other god mentions Orpheus's lyre, so I'm going to count it. Two more things worth mentioning briefly. The first is the staff he's wielding, which is called a caduceus, and is one of the objects most directly associated with Hermes and Mercury, his Roman equivalent. The caduceus is a staff encircled by two snakes. You can see the snake-like figures on the sides of the staff he carries in the game, and there are a few different depictions of it on screen now. There's a chance this might look a bit familiar to you, and I'll explain why. This symbol is often used as a piece of medical iconography, so you may have seen it before in that kind of context. What makes this interesting is that there's another staff with a really similar design that you may also have seen in a similar context, called the Rod of Asclepius, which only has one snake encircling it. Asclepius was the Greek god of healing and medicine, so it makes sense as to why that would be present in a medical setting. So why is the Caduceus there? Simple answer, it was a mistake. They're just really similar. There was a survey taken in the US in 1992 regarding this, which detailed that 62% of professional healthcare associations used the Rod of Asclepius as their symbol, and that 76% of commercial healthcare organisations used the Caduceus symbol. This was one of those moments where the most interesting thing surrounding an ancient piece of iconography was actually modern, rather than older, and what's particularly interesting is how far removed from Hermes its current usage is, how fallaciously and erroneously it's put into place. The last thing I wanted to mention was the wings on his shoes. They're on his head too, but we're focusing on shoes first. I'm not going to say much about them, because this is the most ubiquitous thing you'll see in any iteration of Hermes as a character. All I'll say is that these do exist in myth, although more concretely in Roman myth and art than in Greek. The Latin word for these winged sandals was talaria, or talaris in the singular. They help him move quickly. In some myths, Perseus uses them in his quest to kill the Gorgon Medusa. There's not much more to say about them, honestly. As for the wings on his head, the origin of this is as much an Etruscan thing as it is a Greek and Roman thing. Basically, the Etruscans were people who, like the Romans, also lived in what is now Italy, who benefited from a back and forth relationship with the ancient Greeks and the early Romans, in terms of religious and artistic influence, that is. The Etruscan equivalent of Hermes and Mercury was called Terms, and was often depicted with a winged cap. I might be wrong, but I feel like Hermes wasn't depicted with a winged cap that regularly in ancient Greek culture, like with the sandals. Therefore, it's interesting to consider if Terms will have had an influence on artworks of Mercury, who from Roman times onwards was often depicted with a winged cap. Nowadays, myths have conflated a bit, and it's common to see Hermes with a winged cap in modern depictions, despite it being a seemingly less common piece of iconography in ancient Greece. Moving on, there's actually one more wee topic. The main thing that Hermes talks about in the game, apart from being fast, is actually Charon, and the fact that he's a bit different to the other gods because he's the only one who busies himself with underworld stuff. In some Greek myths, Hermes was often considered a Chthonic god because of this. For example, the epithet Chthonius, however you want to spell it, was often attributed to Hermes. Here's an example from Aeschylus. Supreme herald of the realm above and the realm below, O Hermes, Chthonius, come to my aid, summon to me the ancestral spirits beneath the earth to hear my prayers. The game does detail what the brunt of his job was regarding the underworld, with Zagreus saying that he brings souls of the departed to Charon's boat, and Hermes himself saying much the same thing. He brings them in, Charon takes them down. He also calls Charon his professional associate, which there is some artistic precedent for. If you look at this urn painting here, you can tell it's Hermes because of his staff, which is meant to be the Caduceus, alongside Charon in his boat. So it turns out that a working relationship between Hermes and Charon definitely has a basis, and I think we'll call it there for Hermes. Next up is our final Olympian, Demeter. Another message here. It says, one small spoon dried oregano, two spoons extra virgin olive oil, one large onion, minced, a dash of salt to taste. Oh, wait, this isn't for you, though you should try it sometime if you ever make it out. The Goddess of Seasons is the last Olympian god you'll come across in Hades, and the last on our list. 
In Hades there are a few ways in which Demeter differs from her fellow gods and goddesses, so let's have a look at some of these starting with her age. Demeter is visibly older than every other god in the game. Some gods like Zeus don't exactly look young, but it isn't nearly the same thing as with her. This brings up the question of whether or not she directly controls her appearance. There are myriad examples in mythology of gods changing shape, taking up disguises, all just at will, so I don't think it'd be mental to assume that in this game the gods could do the same if they wanted. Gods don't age in the same way as humans, so what's happened here is that Demeter has almost definitely chosen to appear as older. There's a bit of dialogue where she says that she believes that true wisdom only comes with age, for example. She also looks decidedly wintry for being the goddess of seasons, but we'll chat about that when we get to Persephone. As far as I've found, there aren't really many, if any, ancient sources that would back up these aesthetic elements, so what's going on here? This is where the structure of this section gets a bit trickier, because for the most part it's been looking at the game and seeing how well it lines up with mythology. Demeter is the first character we've really come across where things intentionally don't line up with established myth. If you cast your mind back to the Aphrodite section, I mentioned that technically she was the eldest Olympian, but the game, as you can see here in the codex, calls Demeter the eldest Olympian. Why is the game knowingly going against established myth? When we chatted about Poseidon, we dove into the Titans a little bit. I mentioned that Zeus was the sixth and final child of Kronos and Rhea, but I didn't really mention who children 1 to 5 were. The Theogony puts them in this order. Hestia first, then Demeter, then Hera. After that were the boys, Hades, then Poseidon. In mythology, Zeus and the other five we just mentioned were all direct siblings. There isn't really any other prevailing piece of myth I know of that refutes this. This is why I found it really strange when the game told me that Demeter had different parents. At one point she says she's sprung from Thea, and at another point she is daughter to Hyperion. Hyperion and Thea were siblings of Kronos and Rhea, and you'll have seen them on a family tree earlier in the video. It's on the screen now, just for a wee refresher though. There is not a single iota of evidence, either mythologically or historically, that Demeter is the daughter of Hyperion and Thea. As you can see though, Helios and Selene are, who we mentioned in the Artemis section, as well as Eos, who represents the dawn. There is dialogue in the game in which Demeter mentions that Helios is her brother, so Supergiant obviously looked into who Hyperion and Thea's children actually were. So why add Demeter into the mix here? Well, to be blunt, I'm almost certain that it was just to avoid the story being too incesty. In Hades you play as Zagreus, your parents are Hades and Persephone. Persephone's mom is Demeter, but Demeter is also the sister of Hades, according to conventional myth. This would make Demeter both aunt and grandmother to Zagreus. These kinds of complicated family trees are par for the course in Greek myth, but I'll be honest, it doesn't go down as smoothly nowadays. If they stuck with the mythology we recognise, then we'd have to reconcile with the fact that in the game, Hades is married to his niece. Despite being based in old-fashioned Greek mythology, Hades as a game is progressive in every sense, and frankly, it would seem really incongruous to have the main family dynamic in the game be riddled with incest. Knowing this now, looking at her character is a bit different. Before, it seemed odd that she appeared old, and that the game kept telling you she was the eldest Olympian, but knowing what we now know, you can easily figure out these changes were just meant to help make the world still seem believable, whilst trimming off some of the more unsavoury stuff. As such, I have no issue with her parents in the game not being Kronos and Rhea, because that change has purpose. Supergiant obviously did boatloads of research for this game, and decided that the best place to drop in Demeter would be with the children of Hyperion and Thea. This is because, as we've barely discussed, Demeter is the goddess of seasons, and agriculture, and the Earth's bounty. Matching her with the deities who represent the sun and the moon, concept inextricably linked to the seasons, links to agriculture, is really sensible and totally cogent. There isn't anything incongruent about it, and if you didn't know otherwise, you wouldn't really have reason to question it. So yeah, although Demeter's background might just seem like a mistake on a surface level, it totally isn't. Every change made to her is exclusively for the sake of increased believability regarding the narrative and the world building. I've said it before, myths aren't necessarily absolute, and over time are liable to change. This is possibly the most well thought through instance you'll find in recent media of manipulating pre-existing mythology to construct a totally convincing parallel mythology, and the more I think about it, the more impressed I am at how well Supergiant pulled this off. I've lifted the cold from the earth, much as I said I would, grandson. But near your father's realm, I've decided it shall stay the way it is, bereft of warmth, 
as a reminder to us all about all this. Okay, so we're finally done with the Olympians. The next part of the Codex is headed with Others of Note. So this section deals a bit more with people rather than gods, for the most part at least. A lot of these people come as a pair, so just like how we discussed Hypnos and Thanatos together and the Furies, we'll do that here too. We're going to start with everyone's favourites, Achilles and Patroclus. For this section, there's a few things I'll bring up regarding Achilles, small things the game refers to, and then we'll discuss the both of them together. There isn't really anything to say about Patroclus that doesn't directly relate to Achilles. So Achilles was a soldier mostly known for his exploits in the Trojan War, which we'll get into soon, and is easily one of the most recognisable names from all of Greek mythology. Although to be honest, this is less because of the mythology, and more to do with the fact that the phrase Achilles heel is pretty commonplace, in English at least, and to a lesser extent you also have the Achilles tendon located in the heel area too. It's interesting when a character is more famous for how they died than what they actually did. Achilles was shot in the heel with an arrow during the Trojan War, and that killed him. The Codex makes a reference to this when discussing the bow, with Achilles saying, For it was by the bow that my own life was ended early in a manner of debatable glory. This might seem like an abrupt segue, but we're going to move straight on to discussing Achilles' mum, but I promise this does link into his being shot in the heel. Again, because Achilles wrote the in-game codex, there are plenty of references to him, and on a few occasions he mentions his mother. There are two instances here, saying, My mother taught me countless water-dwelling denizens, and also here, saying, He's seen loads of fish growing up with the kind of mother he had. There's also a bit of dialogue where he says he used to pray to his mother. Achilles' mom was called Thetis, and she was either a sea goddess or a sea nymph, depending who you ask. The point is that she wasn't mortal, but Achilles was. As such, she went to great lengths to protect Achilles from harm, and the most famous example of this is when she submerged Achilles in the river Styx, holding him by his heel. The Styx supposedly had properties, meaning that it made your skin invulnerable to harm after it touched you, but the only place that didn't touch the water was the heel by which Thetis was dangling him in. You might have already known this, but just in case you didn't, this is of course where the phrase Achilles' heel comes from, and it was really cool to see some references to Thetis in the game. Another thing that Achilles mentions that could do with a bit more explaining is when he mentions a king he used to serve. There are two times I know of when he mentions this. Firstly, in this piece of dialogue where he says, The fool of a king I served, I'd never take up arms for him. And secondly, in the Codex entry for Hades, where he says that in life he once served someone who reminded me of him a little. The king in question here is Agamemnon, who led the Greeks against the Trojans in the Trojan War. I won't go into any background stuff about Agamemnon, but he's pretty interesting to say the least. If you want to look into anything surrounding him, search up his name alongside either Clytemnestra or Iphigenia, and have a wee read. Let's stick to Achilles for now though, in particular where he said he'd never take up arms for him. This refers to a disagreement between Agamemnon and Achilles during the Trojan War, and this disagreement is actually the entire basis of the first book of Homer's Iliad. Essentially, Agamemnon demanded that Achilles hand over a slave of his, a woman called Briseis, and Achilles was so offended by this demand that he subsequently refused to fight for Agamemnon after that. There's more to it than that, but those are the basics. Let's look at the passage from the Iliad that deals with this. I will myself come to your tent and take the fair-cheeked Perseus, your prize, so that you will understand how much mightier I am than you, and another may shrink from declaring himself my equal and likening himself to me to my face. So he spoke. Grief came upon the son of Peleus, and within his shaggy breast his heart was divided, whether he should draw his sharp sword from beside his thigh, and break up the assembly, and slay the son of Atreus, or stay his anger and curb his spirit. Achilles was such a fearsome warrior that his absence would leave an incalculable void in the Greek offence, but this is where Patroclus comes into the story. In Hades, dialogue with Patroclus is where you get a fair amount of the background info surrounding the Trojan War and the relationship between him and Achilles. As such, he does mention exactly what we just discussed, saying that Achilles refused to take up arms. After he tells you this, you get the chance to have an extended conversation with Achilles, and going back to a screen we were just looking at, he mentions that Patroclus took up his armour and led their brothers into battle in his guise. This is pretty much how it goes in the Iliad too, but there is one detail that doesn't get brought up in the game. Achilles actually supported the idea for Patroclus to disguise himself. Patroclus says, And grant me to buckle upon my shoulders that armour of thine, in hope that the Trojans may take me for thee, and so desist from war. And a few lines later, Achilles says, But come, do thou put upon thy shoulders my glorious armour, and lead forth the war-loving Myrmidons to the fight. 
The game is quite ambiguous about how this came to happen, and I think this ambiguity is meant to add emotional emphasis to what happened after Patroclus went into battle, which is, of course, his death. Zagreus brings up that Achilles follows shortly in a rage, which is what happens. He basically storms through the battlefield, in a rage, and kills Hector, the closest thing the Trojans had to Achilles. All to avenge Patroclus. This unsurprisingly leads into our final point, which is how the game deals with the relationship between Achilles and Patroclus. Hades elected to take the route of their relationship being romantic rather than platonic, which I think is definitely the best route to take. Ancient sources, and some modern sources, disagree on the nature of their relationship. The Iliad, for example, does not outright paint them as lovers, but writers such as Aeschylus and Plato did, as we'll see in a second. The game is not subtle about their feelings for one another. Achilles said they could have been no closer, and referring to Patroclus, tells Zagreus that his heart belongs to another, for example. It's hard not to immediately compare the portrayal of their relationship in the game with the portrayal of their relationship in Madeline Miller's 2011 novel The Song of Achilles, which is excellent, by the way, and you should definitely read it. This is probably the most notable modern depiction of a romantic relationship between the two. She has a Q&A about the book on her website, and one question in particular is worth reading in its entirety. Most people don't know that much about Patroclus and his relationship with Achilles. How did you come up with your theory that their friendship grew into love? She says, I stole it from Plato. The idea that Patroclus and Achilles were lovers is quite old. Many Greco-Roman authors read their relationship as a romantic one. It was a common and accepted interpretation in the ancient world. We even have a fragment from a lost tragedy of Aeschylus where Achilles speaks of his and Patroclus's frequent kisses. There is a lot of support for their relationship in the text of the Iliad itself, though Homer never makes it explicit. For me, the most compelling piece of evidence, aside from the depth of Achilles' grief, is how he grieves. Achilles refuses to burn Patroclus' body, insisting instead on keeping the corpse in his tent, where he constantly weeps and embraces it, despite the horrified reactions of those around him. That sense of physical devastation spoke deeply to me of a true and total intimacy between the two men. One thing Hades does really well is capture the zeitgeist, and it is beyond refreshing to see the relationship between the two of them as being just as Madeline Miller explained. It's a true, tender intimacy, a love that has transcended death, and ultimately, in Hades, a source of light in the most hellish of circumstances. Well, if it isn't the ward of Achilles, come to visit us. I don't know how I can ever repay you, stranger. I'm quite sure that it isn't possible. I reached more or less the same conclusion, but... While we're on the topic of couples, let's move on to our next one. This time we're looking at Orpheus and Eurydice. We'll have a look at Orpheus first, then Eurydice a bit, and then the two of them together. To start, we'll look at his design, which is really interesting. Main things to note are his hair and his general depressing demeanour. We'll talk about why he's so sad later, but hair-wise you'll not find any ancient sources that make Orpheus look remotely like this, although that's hardly a surprise. It's much more likely that this element of his appearance was based on other singers, thinking of iconic looks for David Bowie or The Cure's Robert Smith. You can definitely see similarities. Orpheus, as you'll know if you've played the game or know the myths, was a musician whose abilities went past what should have been achievable for a normal human. In Eurydice's Codex entry, you see that it describes Orpheus as a common mortal, talented beyond compare, but not a god. This is interesting because it narrows down which myths Supergiant used in writing the character. When it comes to his parentage, Orpheus is usually the son of the muse Calliope who you can essentially consider the goddess of epic poetry. However, his father is either a king called Iagrus, or the god of music himself, Apollo. There's dialogue in which Zagreus asks Orpheus if it was Apollo who taught him to sing, and he kind of says yes in response. To me, this lines up with the version of Orpheus we see in the Argonautica, an epic poem we mentioned back in the Ares section, where he isn't the child of two divinities, but rather Calliope and that king I mentioned and at some point he meets and learns from Apollo, rather than being Apollo's son. To be bluntly honest, it doesn't really impact the game that Orpheus was portrayed this way. It's more interesting just seeing which takes on the myths the game considers canon, or easiest to transpose into the narrative. Hades has eschewed the line of thought that makes Orpheus the son of Apollo, and matched other tidbits you find throughout to be consistent with that original choice. I find that really fascinating. Okay, now a little bit about Eurydice. Again, her codex entry calls her a nymph, born of the oak itself. You might remember we discussed nymphs briefly in the Artemis section, saying that they're essentially nature spirits. 
Eurydice has a bit of dialogue explaining this nicely, saying there's loads of different kinds of nymphs, and chiefly that for every bit of terrain, there's a kind of nymph who loves it. The game claims that Eurydice is born of oak, which goes a long way to explain her design, but does that actually hold up in any mythological sources? Honestly, this wasn't something that I really knew off the top of my head, but in looking this up, I came across a Reddit thread where someone asked this very question, and the person who responded was actually Greg Kasavin, the guy who wrote the story for Hades. His response was really interesting. He said, One of the fascinating things about Greek myth is that it's filled with contradictions. Some sources about Eurydice suggest she was a dryad, a tree spirit, or more specifically an oak nymph, which is the interpretation we found most compelling in developing our version of the character. I've seen many renditions of Eurydice, in classical art and so on, but none that suggest this visually. We of course take license with Hades, though do strive for authenticity within the mythological canon as much as possible, so this detail about Eurydice is very much inspired by the source material. And unsurprisingly, he is right. He links to two sources he used, examples of which you can see on screen, and if you want to go look at this yourself, I've linked this wee thread in the description. You can see why they elected to go ahead with this specific portrayal of Eurydice, because she is a tough, steadfast, and unwavering character, much like an oak. We've mentioned this already, but this is what makes mythological adaptations so interesting. You can, to a degree, pick and choose. As Greg Kasavin said, myth is filled with contradictions, but from a creative standpoint, that's actually more freeing than it is constraining. Eurydice being an oak nymph might not be the most prevailing idea in myths about her, but it does exist, and in this game, it sets the tone for her character perfectly. Okay, we've chatted about both of their designs briefly, but now it's time to discuss them together. Rather than spend loads of time discussing what the Orpheus and Eurydice myth is, I'll explain that as quickly as I can, and then what we'll do is look at a few of the ways Hades refers to that story. Orpheus and Eurydice were in love, and then she died. Heartbroken, he ventured into the underworld to retrieve her. Hades agreed, under one condition. She will follow him back out of the underworld, but if he looks back to see if she's there, he'll lose her forever. He gets most of the way, but eventually gives in, turns around, and she gets whisked away, never to return to the surface. Pretty sad story. Let's look now at some of the details. Firstly, Eurydice's death. In Hades, she mentions that she was killed by a snakebite. This totally lines up with adaptations of the story, one example being in Ovid's Metamorphoses. While through the grass, delighted naiads wandered with the bride, a serpent struck its venomed tooth in her soft ankle, and she died. Where stories differ is what was happening to her before she was bitten. Often it's purely accidental, but sometimes she steps on a snake because she's being chased, in some versions by a satyr, and according to Virgil, by a minor beekeeping god called Aristeus. Either way, the game totally lines up with the established myth. Next up, the Codex calls Orpheus among the only mortals who once ventured down into the underworld and returned to tell the tale. This is true, but you could be a bit nitpicky about it, depending on how many you consider to be among the only. Other mythological figures who popped in and out of the underworld are as follows. Odysseus pops in to have a chat with a prophet called Tiresias for a bit of information. Aeneas does much the same, but instead goes for a chat with his dead dad. Hercules, or Heracles, I prefer to call him Hercules though it's more well known. Anyway, Hercules went in to capture and retrieve Cerberus as the last of his twelve labours, which he managed to do. Theseus also went in and out of the underworld, but his story is slightly more ignoble than the others. He only got out because Hercules found and freed him when he was there to get Cerberus. Also, Theseus was stuck to a rock and couldn't get up. When Hercules freed him, he genuinely ripped his arse off. Zagreus does mention all of these people leaving the underworld, and a bit of dialogue with Hades by the way. Anyway, you get the point. Orpheus' underworld story is likely the most famous in Greek myth, but there are plenty of others, a good few of which I haven't mentioned. One last thing about how this myth is discussed in Hades, and that is that Eurydice mentions that Orpheus and her won Persephone over with their little duet. This is referring to the point in the story in which Orpheus asks Hades and Persephone if he can have Eurydice back, and how he convinces them. I think this is where you'd find the biggest divergence. There might be some ancient source somewhere in which they perform together, but I don't know of it. Every version of the story I've ever seen has Orpheus performing alone. Look at this excerpt again from Ovid. Fame declared that conquered by the song of Orpheus, for the first and only time, the hard cheeks of the fierce Eumenides were wet with tears. Nor could the royal queen, nor he who rules the lower world, deny the prayer of Orpheus. So they called to them Eurydice, who was still held among the new arriving shades, and she obeyed the call by walking to them with slow steps, 
yet halting from her wound. This directly refers to Persephone, the royal queen, being moved by the music, but Eurydice played no part in that. However, that's not a problem. Again, it's like what we've said so much throughout this video, you can take a lot of creative license when it comes to adapting myths. In the game, Eurydice performs alongside Orpheus, and independently of Orpheus. At no point, whether you know the origin myths or not, does this come across as incongruous. It just makes sense. So although there might not be precedent for it, who cares? It's a superior version of events. After all, she is meant to represent the oak, and just like the oak, her voice is imbued with strength, stability, and solidity. I'm grateful that Supergiant very literally gave her the voice that she'd so often been denied throughout mythology. The depiction of Orpheus is very good, but just like what I said at the end of the Charon section, there's a good chance that this particular version of Eurydice, being as spectacular as it is, could go on to be the most influential in recent memory. Look who, Orphe. singing in the blood after all, Orpheus. Thank you for taking my request. Oh, it is certainly my pleasure, Zagreus. This song of Eurydice's and mine, I have a connection to it, I suppose. Reminded me of some fond memories. Next on our list, we have Sisyphus. Obviously, he's huge, super ripped, and despite the shackles he's wearing, is a pretty cheery bloke. You come across Sisyphus exclusively in Tartarus, the part of the underworld where all the worst people have to deal with their sins. Although the Codex says something interesting about that. Most of those who earned the highest form of punishment in Tartarus committed acts I hesitate to commit to the page, though Sisyphus is an exception to the rule. You can see in the next line that the crime he committed was cheating death, arguably a victimless crime, one born of hubris rather than cruelty. As such, he's forced to atone for this crime by repeatedly pushing a boulder to the top of a hill and having it roll back down before he gets to the top. But how exactly did he cheat death? You ask him about this at one point, and the details he gives amounts to giving Hades and Thanatos the slip. However, I'm not sure the game ever strictly tells you how he did this, so we'll go into that now. The reason why Thanatos dislikes Sisyphus with such ardour is that Sisyphus played him for a fool. Essentially, Thanatos was sent to chain him up, and was tricked, and ended up getting chained up himself. Look at this tiny extract from Morford and Leonardin's Classical Mythology to sum it up. Zeus sent Death to carry Sisyphus off. Sisyphus chained Death, and so long as he was bound, no mortals could die. Believe it or not, he actually cheated Death a second time, but we won't go into that here. It does beg the question though, what kind of person would Sisyphus have to have been in order to try and do stuff like this? In Homer's Iliad, he calls Sisyphus the craftiest of men, and in the game, Sisyphus himself tells you that he wasn't much of a good man. Although, the morals of your actions don't necessarily have the largest bearings on your position in the underworld, as we'll see when we chat a bit about Elysium. Being crafty in and of itself is not a trait that would beget eternal torture. Odysseus, for example, was a personage in Greek mythology highly regarded for his intelligence, craftiness, and trickery. I mean, the Greeks even have a god of trickery in Hermes, but trying to cheat death? That one doesn't go down so well. Speaking of Hermes, there's a bit of vague offhand dialogue where he says he took a skinny little chap down to the underworld, got the business end of a sharp spear he did. He had it coming though, a lot of lying, cheating, and the like. Last that I heard, he's still making his amends down there. I can only imagine this is referring to Sisyphus, considering he did a lot of lying and cheating, and is still making his amends. Also, he may well have been skinny before he started having to work out for all eternity. The only thing that confuses me is that I can't find any mention of Sisyphus being killed by a spear. However, you know who was killed by a spear? Odysseus. 
by his own son Telegonus, at least in some versions of the story. This makes me wonder who Hermes is meant to be talking about here, because apart from the manner of death, everything else matches Sisyphus, and it doesn't seem coincidental that the next craftiest fucker in the whole mythos matches the other part. I'm not sure what's going on here, but this isn't the last theory we might have about Odysseus, as we'll see in a few sections' time. I'd like to briefly chat about the impact that this story has had on modern culture, and I think the most prominent example is linguistic in nature. The adjective Sisyphean and the idiom Sisyphean task aren't exactly used in everyday conversation, but do exist in modern day English usage. Unsurprisingly, it just refers to a task that either seems, or is, fruitless, repetitive, and unrewarding. It's the same kind of idea for the word Herculean. Also influenced by myth and referring to the Twelve Labours of Hercules, it means something requiring great strength and willpower. I think it's really interesting that descriptive terms like this have persisted through the ages, and now exist within modern language. But I guess mythology is everywhere around us, whether we know it or not. For example, you might not suspect anything mythological if you look at the verb tantalize or the adjective tantalizing, but the etymology of that word is entirely steeped in myth. It refers to the figure of Tantalus, who tried to trick the gods, failed, and was punished eternally by standing in a pool of water underneath a tree. If he crouched to drink, the water would recede, and if he stretched for fruit from the tree, the branches would rise out of his reach. This is where those words come from. It's fascinating, right? What I find particularly interesting about those three examples is how they all stem from struggle, the most inherently human experience I can think of. Sisyphus, Hercules, and Tantalus all committed pretty serious crimes, and as such were all punished accordingly. Those aforementioned words all originate from the punishment they faced, and that can't just be chance. There's something universally relatable in the consequences they dealt with, which has to be why those stories survived and are still retold to this day. And on that note, I'd like to briefly head into the final point in this section, focusing on one of those retellings. Well, kind of. It's not so much of a retelling, but more an essay expounding the philosophical ramifications of ceaseless punishment. Le Mythe de Sisyphe by Albert Camus, or just the myth of Sisyphus in English. Predominantly, the essay deals with the concept of absurdism, something Camus became quite well known for, but the part we're interested in also happens to be undoubtedly the most famous. He finishes his discussion on the issue by saying this. Il faut imaginer Sisyphe heureux. I'm sorry for saying it in French and sounding like a wanker, but honestly, the translation of this, one must imagine Sisyphus happy, does not have nearly the same impact as the original French. I'm aware that makes me sound like even more of a wanker, but it is true. But how does this tie into Hades? Why must we imagine Sisyphus to be happy? In the game, there is no character more at peace with their lot than Sisyphus. No one really comes close to the level of acceptance and calm that he shows. Here's an example. Zagreus expresses regret that Sisyphus is stuck in endless suffering, and he replies, saying to save those sympathies for someone else, that he could have it so much worse. This is interesting because when isolated, this would seem like a front. Surely no one could actually feel that way in his situation, but the more you play, the more you go through your own Sisyphean and Herculean escape attempts, the more you realize that Sisyphus is being earnest, and you come to understand why. No character represents the ideals behind Hades and the entire roguelike genre more aptly than Sisyphus. After all, he does tell you that repetition is the key to mastery. And he's right. With practice, with reflection, and ultimately with time, no hill is impossible to climb, and no obstacle is truly insurmountable. And no, if you were wondering, Sisyphus and Myth did not go all Tom Hanks and Castaway and name the boulder Baldy. Although I wish he had. You're much too kind to this old soul, Prince said. The thing is, this is home. For me and Baldy, it is what it is. Though, knowing that the Furies won't be visiting with quite their former regularity, that is a load off. Heavier than Baldy there. You mean you're really going to stay, even though you don't have to? Is that so odd, Highness? I don't see myself lugging old Baldy out of here besides. And if I were to leave, why, we would not be having these exchanges now and then. I happen to enjoy them quite a bit. Now, here you go, and thank you very much. Next up is our final character pairing for the whole video, Theseus and Asterius. It's made abundantly clear in the game, but just in case there's any ambiguity here, Asterius is the Minotaur. Again, like all the other sections that have focused on more than one person, these two characters are inextricably linked and need each other for context. 
so let's look a bit into why these two are a pairing in both the game and this video. There's a chance that you'll have come across the myth of the Minotaur and the Labyrinth, even if you don't know much about mythology at all. It was definitely one of the first stories I remember learning about as a kid. Here's the basics, and then we'll discuss the two characters more individually. The Minotaur was a horrifying half-man, half-bull creature that was contained within an underground labyrinth on the island of Crete. We'll go into how he got there later. The point is, as retribution for the death of his son, who was assassinated in Athens, King Minos of Crete started demanding what were essentially Athenian teenage sacrifices, seven boys and seven girls. How frequently this happened is debated, but Plutarch said it was once every nine years, so we'll just go with that. These kids were then dropped into the labyrinth and were consequently devoured by the Minotaur. Eventually, a young Theseus volunteered to go with the intention of slaying the Minotaur and breaking this sacrificial cycle. He went in and killed the Minotaur. We'll talk more about how exactly he did that in a second, but that's the crux of the story. Minos sacrifices for the labyrinth, Theseus kills the Minotaur. Much like how we looked at the Orpheus and Eurydice myth, let's see what scraps of info the game gives us regarding this story and see how it matches up. Worth saying that in the game, Theseus is awful. Totally unbearable, no self-awareness, absolute bellend. There is precedent for him being a prick, and Dionysus makes reference to it when he says he doesn't like Theseus because there was this nice lass who helped him out one time and he just dumped her rotten. The person in question here is Ariadne, the daughter of King Minos, who fell in love with Theseus upon his arrival in Crete. As a quick tangent, Ariadne is almost definitely the person featured in the Cretan princess painting you can buy in the House of Hades, in case you got it and wondered who it might be. Anyway, sorry. This next bit is probably the most famous element of the whole myth. She gave Theseus a ball of thread, which he attached to the entrance of the labyrinth, meaning that he wouldn't get lost. He would just have to follow the thread back to the entrance, provided he could defeat the Minotaur. Theseus promised Ariadne that he would escape the island with her afterwards because in helping him, she was a traitor to her father. As they escaped, they stopped on an island called Naxos. Here, Theseus abandoned Ariadne and left without her. There are different accounts on why he left her there, but the thing that seems pretty universally accepted is that Dionysus found her there and took her as his bride. No wonder he doesn't like Theseus. Although, some of those accounts are that Dionysus made Theseus leave Ariadne as an offering to him in which case he'd have no reason to dislike Theseus. I'm not really sure, but the way the game paints it is that Theseus abandoned her, and looking at him, you can't be that surprised. Another part of the myth that could do with clarification is where Asterius claims that Theseus beat him barehanded. This seems pretty unlikely, but is it actually true? Well, according to the Bibliotheca, he killed him with jabs of his fist, and then made his way out again by pulling himself along the thread. There's also an account from Pindar saying that Theseus strangled the Minotaur, in a similar manner to how Hercules strangled the Nemean lion. However, there's also some sources that say otherwise. Here's an extract from Ovid's Heroides. And would that thy upraised right hand, O Theseus, had not slain with knotty club him that was man in part and in part bull. Also, looking at some ancient artwork depicting the scene, you occasionally see Theseus depicted with what looks like a sword. The point is, did he kill the Minotaur barehanded? Yes and no. But the fact that there's precedent for this at all means that the game still gets it right. Now, two brief points that I don't want to go too deep into at all, but are still worth bringing up. Firstly, Theseus at one point calls himself the greatest king of Athens. This is kind of accurate, actually. Theseus did become king of Athens, and basically liberated the area from Cretan rule. Remember how before the Athenians were kind of under the yoke of King Minos? Theseus sorted that out. This is a gross oversimplification of the matter, but gets the point across. I did say I wanted to deal with these points quickly. Next up, in a bit of dialogue with Poseidon, he says that Zeus started calling Theseus Poseidon's son. By some accounts, this is true, but by almost all accounts, Theseus's father was actually Aegeus, the king of Athens. So how does that work? It's actually a pretty old idea that you come across occasionally in Greek myth, and it's called telegony. This idea goes back to Aristotle, apparently, and is the concept of shared paternity. That is, the child exhibiting the traits of their father, and also other men known to their mother. It's a very antiquated idea, and not one worth giving any legitimate time to, but in the context of myth, it's pretty interesting. It's a weird one, to be honest, but would it be Greek mythology if it wasn't weird? Okay, Minotaur time. Firstly, why is he called Asterius in the game? Well, pretty much because that's actually his name, although you never really come across it.
technically you see him being called Asterion more than Asterius, but it doesn't really matter either way. The name means starry, with the aster bit meaning star, something you'll recognise from words like astronomy and astrology. Two reasons why he could be called this. Firstly, it was also the name of King Minos' father, whose relationship to the Minotaur we'll find out soon. Secondly, it could have some sort of link to the Taurus constellation. If you cast your mind back to the Artemis section, I mentioned that Callisto was turned into a constellation around the time she died. This is actually how most constellations ended up being explained, some sort of mythological figure being made into stars. The Minotaur wasn't turned into a constellation. That was the Cretan bull, a famous bull from Greek myth that upon being killed by Theseus was made into what we now recognise as Taurus. The painting of Theseus that you get in the House of Hades actually has the zodiac symbol for Taurus on it, as you can see just here, a fun wee reference to both his connection to the Cretan bull and the Minotaur. But earlier I said that the Minotaur and his name could have some link to the constellation. This is because the Cretan bull is the Minotaur's father. Let's look into that story. So does Hades tell us anything about this? Yeah, a little bit, and you hear the start of it from Poseidon. He says that the Minotaur was a living testament to his revenge, and then calls it a long and boring story, which isn't true, and a sordid story, which it definitely is. So what does he mean? What was his revenge? Let's look at the Bibliotheca of Pseudo Apollodorus again for some clarification. Minos aspired to the throne, but was rebuffed. He claimed, however, that he had received sovereignty from the gods, and to prove it, he said that whatever he prayed for would come about. So, while sacrificing to Poseidon, he prayed for a bull to appear from the depths of the sea and promised to sacrifice it upon its appearance. And Poseidon did send up to him a splendid bull. Thus, Minos received the rule but he sent the bull to his herds and sacrificed another. Poseidon was angry that the bull was not sacrificed and turned it wild. So that explains part of it. Before we get onto the properly scandalous part, let's look at one more thing mentioned in the game, something Asterius himself brings up. He says his mother was also a queen, and then says that he was treated badly by her. His mother was Persephone, queen to King Minos. Let's continue on with the next bit of the story. He also devised that Persephone should develop a lust for it. In her passion for the bull, she took on as her accomplice an architect named Daedalus. He built a wooden cow on wheels, and then, after placing Persephone inside, set it in a meadow where the bull normally grazed. The bull came up and had intercourse with it, as if with a real cow. Persephone gave birth to Asterius. And that's how the Minotaur came to be. Obviously, King Minos felt enormous shame that this had happened to him and his wife, and that's why the Minotaur was locked away in the labyrinth. It's kind of a sad story, actually, but I'm really glad that the game alluded to it. Although, you definitely would only piece the hints in the game together if you already knew the story. One final thing that is worth mentioning before the next section is that Theseus was actually originally intended to be the protagonist of Hades, before it became what it is. Have a listen to this. But specifically, we were going for uh, our starting point was a uh, Theseus and the Minotaur type, so still Greek mythology, um, and we were so drawn to the idea of the labyrinth as like the perfect setting for kind of a roguelike experience, the ever-shifting labyrinth. I don't have anything to say about that, apart from that it would have been a cool idea, and that you might not have known that. I'm glad they decided on getting out of the underworld as the main premise though, rather than getting in. These two. What hope of you, monster, versus the blessed bonds of brotherhood? That's not the little him, King. He is more powerful than he appears. We must remain alert this time. Oh, I am perfectly alert right now, Asterius. And were I still alive, I would be positively salivating at the thought of running through this pustule with my spear, or whichever means I had available. Now let's go! Next up is Cerberus, who is the first and only character we'll talk about in this video who does not have any dialogue. So who is he? He's a vicious three-headed dog who guards the underworld, making sure no one gets in or out when they aren't meant to. As you'll know if you've played the game and got past Elysium, Cerberus will be there waiting for you in every run at the exit to the underworld, although he seems to spend most of his time chilling out in the House of Hades. Most mentions of Cerberus in mythology have him posted at the entrance, rather than cozying up by the fire at home, but this is a video game, and I would prefer to be able to interact with the dog in the house, rather than have him be on perpetual guard duty. 
One interesting feature about Cerberus is that only his left head is amenable to pets. Zagreus even mentions that the other two heads are called Beta and Gamma, which means the left one must be Alpha. It's pretty funny to imagine that each head is just called the Greek equivalent of heads A, B, and C, and unsurprisingly there is no precedent for this, or each head having a notably different personality. However, I like that the game gave each head a different temperament. This is such a common trope, especially in modern media, and does add a bit of character, especially to one without the ability to speak. That's enough for stuff that doesn't have precedent, though. Let's move on to something we can see concrete evidence for. The way you get past Cerberus in every run is by providing him with a snack, a satyr sack. I mean, he's a monster, but he's still a dog. Of course he's going to enjoy eating and getting treats. Believe it or not, there is explicit precedent for Cerberus having a proclivity towards snacks, and it's the single thing I'm most excited to discuss in this entire video. For this, we have to head back to my favourite, the Aeneid. As always, we're looking in Book 6, where our hero Aeneas ventures into the underworld. Now, the basics of this point are as follows. Aeneas is accompanied by a woman called the Sibyl of Cumae, a prophetess who prepares a snack for Cerberus. This snack is drugged, so that when Cerberus eats it, he'll fall asleep and they can get past him. This will take a bit of explanation, but it's absolutely amazing. So let's have a look at this section of Book 6. Don't worry about understanding the Latin, by the way, I'll talk you through what you need to know. So the snack in question here is Offam, the accusative form of the noun Offa, which can mean something as vague as morsel, or piece of food, or as specific as cake or loaf. It depends on the translation. The point is, Cerberus is a greedy wee boy in the game, and he's a greedy wee boy in mythology too. He shouldn't be accepting snacks from strangers on guard duty, but he does. Thus, it sounds obvious, but that's why feeding Cerberus is how you get past him in the game. However, we aren't quite done here. This is the bit I'm most excited to talk about, and you'll have to forgive me because its connection to the game is scant at best. That being said, it's too interesting to not bring up. I just want to pop back to the few lines of Latin we were looking at a minute ago, and in particular, the lines after the one with Offam in it. Just so no one's out of the loop, here's a translation of this Latin. So, this is the bit where Cerberus snatched the food and gulped it down. What we want to focus on specifically is the middle line of these three, in particular the bit where the comma is. Now here's a few things we need to know for context. Corripit objectam is the bit translated as snatched the bait, and atque just means and, it's continuing the sentence. Anyway, you get that that part is just the specific moment where Cerberus swallows up his snack. One other thing you need to know is that this is ancient epic poetry, and as such has meter. In particular, this meter is called dactylic hexameter, and don't worry, you don't need to know what that is. Just know that there are certain rules that determine how these sentences are spoken, and which syllables you stress. You might know about this if you've ever studied Shakespeare at school. Shakespeare often wrote in a meter called iambic pentameter, which gave his work a unique sing-song kind of rhythm. This is a really famous line from Romeo and Juliet. But soft, what light through yonder window breaks. And what I'm going to do quickly is scan it, as you can see on screen now. Scanning poetry is just pointing out which syllables you stress and which you don't, so that you know how to say it. Iambic pentameter, the meter this is written in, is basic, and follows a heartbeat pattern of unstressed, then stressed, five times over. Scanning dactylic hexameter is a lot more complex. Here is that middle line from before, scanned, for example. Now, one final feature I need to teach you about, please stay with me here by the way, I promise the payoff is worth it, is elision. This happens in language pretty often, and is just when one word slides into another. An example in English is let's, which is an elided form of let us. Elision plays a big role when it comes to scanning ancient poetry like this, and you can see that the am at the end of objectam is a different colour now, right? This is me letting you know that we have to elide that sound, combine that word with the beginning of the next word. Dropping that am makes it sound like objectatque, which you might notice sounds a bit clumsy in the middle. Well, it's taken me long enough to get here, but this is deliberate. This is my favourite thing, honestly. This almost unnatural sounding gap between these two words, created by Virgil's genius use of prosody, is intended to get across the idea of, and mimic, Cerberus swallowing. Honestly. When saying object atque, there's an almost involuntary gulp as you cross the bridge between the two words. 
This isn't accidental, because it takes place at the exact point that Sir Bruce himself gulps down his food. It's just astonishing. It absolutely blows my mind. It's the most incredible thing I've ever seen. I really hope I've got across how cool this is, because it's taken me a few minutes to explain it, and I understand that you might not have an interest in Ancient Poetic Meter, so thank you for letting me go on about that. There's just one last thing to mention when it comes to Cerberus in the game, and that's a comment about him in the Codex, saying that tales of the number of his heads are oft exaggerated. This is a reference to some versions of Cerberus, particularly in earlier myths, that give Cerberus a few more heads. Hesiod gave him 50 heads, and supposedly Pindar gave him 100, but almost everyone else gives him the three you'd expect. Greek myth loves giving shit multiple heads though. Back in the very beginning of this video when I discussed Hades himself, I mentioned that Cerberus was the offspring of Typhon and Echidna, the monsters to end all monsters. Some of his siblings include the Hydra, the Chimera, and Orthrus, a dog just like Cerberus but with only two heads instead of three. Unsurprisingly, Almost all of these monsters have something to do with snakes, too. Some ancient versions of Cerberus also had snakes on his neck. I said it back when we talked about the Furies, but wow, they really liked making stuff snaky back in the day, too. Well, look at you, boy. Never seen you quite so perky, relatively speaking, of course. Big, tough guy like yourself. You must have missed Mother just as much as she missed you. Well, you've got plenty of time for catching up on things now. <laughs> The monstrous, triple-headed beast of Hades would perhaps be overcome with pure emotion by the joyous circumstances, were he only capable of this. How dare you, sir. Speaking of snakes, that's a good way to segue into talking about Dusa, one of two characters in this game who straight up does not exist in Greek mythology. Kind of. Maybe not. It's complicated. Let's not mince words, there's a definite line of thought here that Dusa is meant to be Medusa the most infamous of all Gorgons. So that's essentially what we'll talk about here. We've mentioned the Gorgons a few times, notably in discussion about Athena's shield, but in case you don't know, let's just discuss what they are. It's a bit tricky to pin down, because sources differ so much, but when people discuss Gorgons, they generally refer to three sisters. Stheno, Euryale, and Medusa. Pretty much everyone has heard of Medusa, but it's the opposite for the other two. You get trios like this a lot in Greek myths, with the Furies, the Fates, the Grey Eye. The Gorgons were monsters, however, horrifying to behold, and in most records, have snakes for hair. This is the most common Gorgon trait, and one that you can see Dusa shares. Other elements are more up for debate, such as whether they have wings or not, but the big aspect we haven't mentioned yet is the petrification thing. If you looked at one of the Gorgons in the eye, you'd be turned to stone. Again, this is so widespread in other mythologies and in modern media that it almost feels trite to talk about it. But this is the basic idea. Monstrous sisters with snake-like hair and a petrifying gaze. Medusa, however, is a ray of sunshine. Super wholesome. So how could she be Medusa? Well, firstly, her name. She's a maid. Her name is Dusa. Maid Dusa. Medusa. Obviously, that doesn't mean she's meant to be Medusa. As we've just said, if you want to make a Gorgon reference, you're stuck with Medusa. No one's going to catch on to a Steno or Uriah pun. Another point that maybe favours this idea is that she's a floating head. I mentioned briefly in the Hermes section that the ancient Greek hero Perseus killed Medusa. I won't go into that story too much here, but the important point is that he killed her by beheading her. The Gorgon head alone is pretty significant imagery, and in the myth he actually kept the head and used it as a weapon of sorts because it still retained its petrifying properties. So, if Medusa was going to exist in the game at all, it would probably be without a body. There's a bit of dialogue where Zagreus asks Dusa if she used to have a body and wings, and she politely refuses to answer. This rabbit hole keeps going though. Let's look at something else she says when Zagreus asks if she's related to the hostile Gorgon heads you come across in Asphodel. Her reply is intriguing, calling them relatives in the loosest sense, saying that it would be like having nasty, almost mindless siblings born entirely from your own blood. Weirdly specific. Now, if we look at the Codex entry for the mindless enemies in question, we see this. As the immortal ichor of the most infamous of Gorgons spilled from her severed head into the earth, it trickled down into the underworld and spawned a brood of vengeful offspring. Now, if we totally ignore any external mythology, it definitely seems like Dusa and Medusa are the same. If it's her blood that they are born from, and that blood belongs to the most infamous of Gorgons, then that kind of explains itself. 
However, is there any precedent whatsoever for creatures springing from the blood spilled from her severed head? There is indeed, although some of it won't be what you expect. Ovid's Metamorphoses says this. As he hovered over Libya's sands, the blood drops from the Gorgon's head dripped down. The spattered desert gave them life as snakes, smooth snakes of many kinds, and so that land still swarms with deadly serpents to this day. So there is a basis for what the game says in a way. Snakes, not Gorgons, but you get the point. The real drama that came from her decapitation was that the winged horse Pegasus emerged from her neck, and that's actually how he was born. I mentioned this briefly when we chatted about Poseidon, because technically Poseidon is the father of Pegasus, but I'm not going to go into the whole Poseidon seducing Medusa thing. That's one you can look up yourself. Anyway, it does definitely seem like the game is giving you hints that Dusa is meant to be Medusa. However, her codex entry does say that a background check could not verify any connection to the notorious Gorgon Sisters of the Surface, which throws a spanner in the works. This is one of those things where you just have to decide yourself, and you could definitely go either way. Personally, I'm just seeing it as a reference to Medusa rather than her being Medusa, but if Supergiant's intention was for her to be Medusa, I wouldn't be surprised. Miss Dusa, I um, wanted to apologize for when I pried about your past. I just wanted to get to know you better, but I was insensitive and I'm sorry. Oh, your highness, Zagreus, come on. Don't even worry about it. I'd already forgotten. Really, no big deal. It's just the past me. It's as though it wasn't even me. This is me now. I'm glad I'm here. Here we have the other character in the game, who is an original creation, who wasn't in Greek myth. And again, just like with Dusa, it might only seem that way. Skelly as a character categorically did not exist in mythology, and as such, there's nothing to really say about him. The format of this video is mostly checking if what's in the game has precedent, and that's kind of impossible when the character is made up for the game. What does merit further examination though, is if Skelly has a secret identity, someone we would actually recognise from Greek myth, and who he might really be. Worth saying up front that he might not actually be anyone, and I don't know if he is, but it can be fun to conjecture. Like Dusa, the game leaves a few clues, a wee trail of breadcrumbs for you to follow. Let's look at some of those clues. For ages, you try to get Skelly to tell you his real identity, and eventually he tells you that his name was Skelemius, captain of the Cretan Second Fleet, sailing on Athens under King Minos. Then he says they sailed into the waters of Charybdis. We'll deal with Charybdis first. Charybdis is a whirlpool. Also a sea monster, but mostly a whirlpool. It's a bit hard to explain, but the point is that the waters of Charybdis are very treacherous. Most often, you'll find Charybdis being discussed as a pair with another sea monster called Scylla. There's a fish you can catch called a Scylla Scion, the description for which calls Scylla a monstrous sea creature that Achilles and his pals were very careful to avoid. Scylla and Charybdis basically lived on either side of a strait, the strait in question most likely being the Strait of Messina, just between Sicily and the Italian mainland. There's actually an idiom about this. Being between Scylla and Charybdis is essentially the same idea as being between a rock and a hard place. Both options are shite, but you have to pick one. Anyway, I could totally buy Skelly coming across Charybdis, but not if he was a captain of the Cretan Second Fleet sailing on Athens. Here's Crete, and here's Athens. Why would he be near Sicily? Sure, in the in-game mythos, Charybdis could be in a different place, or it could just be flowery language implying they sailed into a whirlpool, but looking at the geography, it makes me doubt his testimony. Which is handy actually, because shortly after, he tells you it's all a lie. So that puts you in a bit of a bind trying to figure out who he is. Eventually you ask Asterius if he recognises the name, because after all Asterius is from Crete, and he says he might have heard it. This just confuses things even more. So you confront Skelly again, and he specifies that he never said he made it up, just that you wouldn't believe him. Then he gets a bit huffy, and talks about leading 50 or something sailors in a voyage across the sea in a Minoan galley with nothing but the stars to guide them. And here we get what I think is the biggest clue, although it could be nothing. Zagreus says that Hermes gave him the impression that Skelly was somebody else, nobody in particular. You might have caught on to where I'm taking this now. One final bit of potential evidence is in the codex. These first few lines, the animated skeleton and I, we seldom get along. He is too talkative for me, and spouts such simple condescensions to all those in earshot, seemingly as though he were an expert in the ways of war. I disapprove of his reckless advice, and am uncertain as to who he was in life, 
to be so self-assured in death. Part of this backs up my theory, and part of it goes against it, but my vague idea here is that Skelly could be Odysseus. I'm not saying he is, but a few of the things I've listed above did make me wonder. We've mentioned Odysseus before, but just so you know, Odysseus is the titular character in the Odyssey, arguably the most famous piece of ancient literature there is. He was a hero who fought with the Greeks in the Trojan War. So let's look at the clues. Firstly, I think the Skelemius name is a lie, obviously, and the details about being part of the Cretan Second Fleet, but his second outburst about this, where he goes into captaining a ship with nothing but the stars to guide them, does line up with Odysseus. It might be tenuous, but Odysseus is a leader, the king of an island called Ithaca, and as such he is the main authority figure throughout the voyages undertaken during the Odyssey. Odysseus would know all about captaining a ship, but then again, that doesn't actually prove anything. It could still go either way. What makes it seem a little bit more likely to me is that Skelly brought up Charybdis. Charybdis actually doesn't get mentioned that much in ancient sources. The most prominent mention of it though, you'll find in the Odyssey. There's a sorceress named Circe who plays an important role in the Odyssey, and there's also a very good book about her, also written by Madeline Miller, who we mentioned in the Achilles section, and she warns Odysseus about the dangers of Scylla and Charybdis. Under it, awesome Charybdis sucks the dark water down. Three times a day she belches it forth, three times in hideous fashion she swallows it down again. Pray not to be caught there when she swallows down. Poseidon himself could not save you from destruction then. Charybdis does also appear in the story of Jason and the Argonauts, as well as in the Aeneid, but I would wager that its appearance in the Odyssey is the most well known and significant. If Skelly was Odysseus, he would have encountered Charybdis firsthand. Him and the Whirlpool do share a connection. The next clue is the Nobody one. Again, this could be really tenuous, but it also could be a genuine reference. Possibly the most famous section of the Odyssey is when Odysseus outsmarts the Cyclops Polyphemus. Odysseus and his men had been captured by the Cyclops, and eventually Odysseus managed to trick his way out of the situation, as he so often does. He told Polyphemus that his name was Nobody, and later, when opportunity struck, attacked the Cyclops. Here's how it went down in the story. Odysseus found a club lying in the cave, which with the help of four comrades, he sharpened to a point. He then heated it in the fire and blinded the Cyclops. Polyphemus cried out for help to the neighbouring Cyclopes, who came and asked who was injuring him. When he replied, nobody, they assumed he meant no one was hurting him, so they went away again. As he escaped, his hubris got the better of him, and Odysseus eventually told the Cyclops his real name, which ended up costing him pretty dearly, as you'll know if you've read the Odyssey before. This was the moment where I thought Skelly might be Odysseus, but again, the word nobody isn't exactly uncommon. The use of it in this particular situation just made me wonder. One final clue is what was written in the Codex. As though he were an expert in the ways of war, and to be so self-assured in death, both would fit Odysseus as a character. He was smart, sneaky, a fierce warrior, and above all else, replete with pride, as we've just discovered. It's also worth considering the fact that Achilles is the one who has written the Codex, and that Achilles and Odysseus knew each other quite well in Greek myth. They interact a fair bit in the Iliad, and they're often painted as opposites. Odysseus was usually calm, level-headed, and temperate, while Achilles was passionate, hot-headed, and aggressive. They were pretty antithetical, and maybe that's why Achilles says that he and Skelly seldom get along. But then again, reckless advice and being too talkative might not be the most Odysseus-like traits. So again, it could be nothing. Although, you could argue that he was too talkative when he started bragging as he was escaping Polyphemus. But yeah, this is my theory, and I would totally accept it being wrong, but I do kind of hope it's right. I was really hoping that the final Skelly statue would give us a hint towards his true identity, but I don't think it does. Oh, and if you've played the game and don't know who Skelly's employer is yet, try equipping his lucky tooth keepsake on your next run and make sure to speak to Hermes. It might help get that storyline going. Anyway, time to move on. Finally free, boyo. Farewell, Skelly. <laughs> Got you pretty good again, didn't I, boyo? I am asking you to get me out of here. <laughs> all that stuff about your blade and your aspect, I mean, you ate all of it right up. <laughs> 
Believe it or not, this is the final character in the game we need to discuss, before we move on to brief discussion of the locations and weapons, so let's get on with it. The character in question is Persephone, goddess of Verger, queen of the underworld, and mother to Zagreus. Precedent-wise, all of those things are true in mythology. She's the goddess of stuff like spring and vegetation, she does reign alongside Hades in the underworld, and she is, in at least some sense, mother to both forms of Zagreus we've discussed in this video the Zagreus in the game, and the Dionysus Zagreus from Orphic mythology. As such, let's not waste time and look at the most obvious question. Why is the cheerful goddess of springtime the queen of the underworld? The game takes a pretty modern approach to the story and describes it as willful and consensual elopement, facilitated by Zeus. Persephone is the daughter of Demeter, as we'll go into, and Persephone leaving Mount Olympus had to be done on the sly. In mythology, and in art history, this event is called the Rape of Persephone. In the Zeus section I mentioned the uncomfortable ambiguity in Greek mythology when it comes to things like seduction, abduction, and rape. There is ambiguity here too in some ways, but there isn't ambiguity regarding whether Persephone was taken of her own volition, because she definitely wasn't. I understand why the game made it consensual, and I'm glad it did, but this is not how it goes down in the stories. She was taken. The reason it's called the Rape of Persephone comes from the use of the Latin verb rapere, which you can see in the version of the story you'll find in Ovid's Metamorphoses. In this particular instance, it is referring to abduction, and you'll often hear that the word rape used in this way does primarily mean abduction. For example, you may have heard of the Rape of the Sabine Women, an event in early Roman history in which multiple women were kidnapped and taken back to Rome. I'll be honest, I think part of the reason why modern readings of these events often rationalise these things as being purely abduction is because it makes it more palatable. But on the other side, you could argue that that's a pretty reductive way to look at it. I think that that latter idea might be too cynical a perspective, though. Look at it this way. A recent poem called Persephone to Hades by Northern Irish poet Nikita Gill recontextualises this myth, with the first stanza saying, You are the kindest thing that ever happened to me even if that is not how our tale is told. There's been a recent trend of myth retelling in contemporary literature, which I really like. For example, the two Madeline Miller books we've brought up are some of the most famous. Again, as I mentioned in the Zeus section when discussing Dr. Emily Wilson's translation of the Odyssey, mythology never gave women the space for their own interpretations on these stories, stories which involve and revolve around them. That's why books like Circe are so important. Myth is fluid, not concrete, and should be adapted for the modern age by contemporary voices. The Silence of the Girls by Pat Barker gives a voice to Perseus, mentioned only in this video as the property of Achilles, and then the property of Agamemnon during the Trojan War. Margaret Atwood's Penelope ad gives life to Penelope, the wife of Odysseus, and there are so many more books like this which are finally giving women the opportunity to tell the stories of other women. There's unquantifiable value in agency, and the transfer from forcible passivity to unfettered autonomy. As such, it's hard not to support recontextualizing myth in the way that Hades has done with Persephone. This video is all about precedent, but progression is often more important than faithful adaptation. So let's do a bit more storytelling. Hades took Persephone down to the underworld, and Demeter was absolutely raging that her daughter had gone missing. This is why Demeter is so wintry in the game. It's meant to take place during that point in Greek myth where she was fuming that she hadn't yet found Persephone, because Persephone eventually being found by Zagreus and eventually by Demeter and the Olympians is the entire premise of the narrative in Hades. We'll skip forward a bit now though and talk about how pomegranates link to the story. It's universally accepted that the reason Persephone had to stay in the underworld was because she ate pomegranate seeds, which bound her to the realm. Here's an extract from the Homeric hymn to Demeter detailing that. The game brings this up as well, with Persephone telling Zagreus that for every seed you eat, you can't leave the underworld for that many months in a year. I thought it was pretty funny that she then tells you she just made it up. Again, a slight element of giving autonomy, a slight element of mocking what is a pretty silly myth. You might already know, but the Persephone being kidnapped myth existed for the purpose of rationalising seasons. The time that Persephone had to spend in the underworld was when you had bad weather, because Demeter was in a mood. But when she was back on the surface, that's why the weather was good, because Demeter was no longer in a mood. Zacharias explains pretty much that exact idea to Orpheus here, saying that they have rules about that stuff. How the game treats this myth has to be slightly different to all the others, because as I said, this myth is what was transposed into the main narrative of the game. 
As such, the characters are playing with the details a bit more than all the other myths we've spoken about so far. There's just one last thing I'd like to go into, and it's just another thing where we check the veracity of something the game says. Demeter says that Persephone's father was a base-born farm boy, and as such, Persephone is only divine on her mum's side. There might be a record of this being the case somewhere, but the overwhelming verdict is that Persephone's dad is actually Zeus in most significant mythological sources. The main reason this was changed is the exact same reason we discussed in the Demeter section, regarding why they made Demeter's parentage different. It's to avoid weird incest stuff in a game that doesn't need to have weird incest stuff in it. Hades marrying the daughter of two of his siblings just gets a bit too out there. And with that, I think we're done for all the characters. As I said at the start, I will have missed loads of stuff and probably been wrong about loads of it too, so I'm sorry about that. There's still a few things for us to go over though, so let's have a look at some of the locations you can find in the game. I suppose I can see that. I thought I might end up like father, growing old, wasting away. Then the time flew by, and I realized I was closer to mother's side. Mortals certainly don't have it easy, but their limited days, it means they live their lives to the fullest, I think. At least we've some of that in us. Indeed, my son. I'll just say from the off that these sections are going to be a bit shorter and a bit less concretely structured than all the character sections, so don't expect it to be the same sort of format. A lot more creative license was taken with the locations and weapons in comparison to the characters, and as such, there isn't going to be quite as much mythological precedent to discuss. That being said, what we do discuss is still going to be really interesting. First up location-wise is the House of Hades, which in the game is the literal house you live in at the base of the underworld. In Greek myth, the House of Hades is not a house, but rather a way of describing the entirety of the underworld. Supergiant, as I just alluded to, have taken creative license and made the House of Hades an actual house. It's a super smart idea, and executed really well, but this house is not in mythology. House of Hades is a pretty common phrase, I mean you come across it in the Iliad and the Odyssey pretty often, but not much more to say about it than that. It's just the underworld. Told you some of these sections would be shorter. Shades of the dead mill constantly within the house, complaining of their woes, and seeking audience from any who would listen. I listen. So the next three areas I want to discuss are Tartarus, Asphodel, and Elysium. These three make up pretty much all of the underworld, and what I'd like to do before chatting about each of them individually is give you a bit of general underworld info, in the hope that it contextualizes the whole thing a bit more. This is pretty much the same idea as the sections which dealt with more than one character, I guess. Okay, so here's a few things you need to know about the underworld. Firstly, the topography is essentially unknown. In the game, you start at the bottom and go up through Tartarus, and then Asphodel, and then Elysium, and after that you're pretty much at the surface. This is a logical way of organizing the underworld for the game, and there are pretty much no sources I know of that draw out some kind of canonical underworld map. The main thing you hear when it comes to underworld location stuff comes from Hesiod, where he talks about how long it would take for an anvil to reach Tartarus. For a brazen anvil falling down from heaven nine nights and days would reach the earth upon the tenth. And again, a brazen anvil falling from earth nine nights and days would reach Tartarus upon the tenth. From this, there is confirmation, if we can call it that, that the underworld is indeed under the world and not just a vague and nebulous nether realm that doesn't necessarily have a tangible location. We'll chat about where the entrance to the underworld is supposed to be later on. But yeah, if you're trying to get your head around where stuff in the underworld is, you're probably best not to really try to, and just go with the flow. It's best to just know a bit about the separate areas and some of the features, like the rivers, and maybe go off what scant links you'll find connecting them. Speaking of the rivers, this was one of the main things I wanted to discuss considering they actually appear a lot in the game. You'll recognize at least three of the rivers of the underworld if you've played the game. Firstly, the Styx, which is the one you see both in Tartarus and right at the top by the entrance slash exit. Secondly, the Phlegathon, the river of fire which has engulfed Asphodel. And thirdly, the Lethe, which flows through Elysium. There are two more which don't get mentioned in the game as far as I know, although I might have missed that. There's the Cachytus and the Acheron. 
These five rivers weave their way through the underworld and all represent some sort of underworldly idea. The Styx is the river of hate, the Phlegathon is the river of fire, pretty much what I said before, the Lethe is the river of forgetfulness, and this is why Patroclus says it's all forgettable with a single drink, the Cacitus is the river of lamentation and wailing, and finally the Acheron, which is the river of pain. All of these rivers play a role in different myths, so it's worth getting to grips with what they are, and more importantly, what concepts they're meant to represent. The two most important, though, are definitely the Styx and the Acheron. In popular culture, we know the Styx as being the river that leads into the underworld, but ancient sources sometimes go with the Acheron instead. A fun fact about this is that the Acheron is the only one of these rivers which is actually a real river in Greece, which is likely where the idea that it led into the underworld came from. So yeah, that's solar there is to that, really. Worth knowing, though, that the Phlegathon flooding Asphodel, that's hard to say, is only a thing that happens in the game, not in any myths. Okay, so Tartarus. Near the start of this video, when we discussed Nyx, I think, I brought up that Tartarus was actually a primordial deity, and that often primordial deities represented realms. So that's one of the ways that it's worth looking at Tartarus, as if it's alive. Personally, I think this plays into the core idea of the gameplay really well. It makes sense for the biomes in the game to have shifting chambers if the underworld itself is alive. And this is perhaps why Achilles tells Zagreus that his real enemy is actually the underworld itself, as opposed to Hades, or the monsters he fights. The other thing we know about Tartarus from this video, mainly from when we talked about Sisyphus, is that it's where the worst of the worst go. The Codex says of the people consigned to Tartarus that punishment is all that is left for souls such as these, no more chance of rehabilitation, only suffering. Knowing this gives us a chance to do a bit more contextualization. I'll be honest, this is a really oversimplified and reductive way to approach this, but it gets across the concept. It's worth looking at Tartarus as being similar to the Western idea of Hell, a place where the wicked are punished. Elysium is much the opposite, being the ancient Greek equivalent of Heaven. Asphodel is the kind of middle ground for those who weren't particularly bad or good, and I guess it's kind of like Purgatory. Again, don't quote me on that, because it isn't strictly accurate. This is just a way of getting context for what the areas are meant to represent for people who are new to this kind of thing. There are plenty of nasties locked up in Tartarus, but the most famous are probably the Titans defeated by the Olympians, Kronos and his cronies. You might remember us looking at that in the Poseidon section, and I briefly mentioned there that they disposed of them in Tartarus. Specifically, it's as Zagreus says here. They chopped the Titans into bits and sprinkled them through Tartarus so they couldn't regenerate. Pretty grim stuff, not somewhere you want to be. Asphodel is a bit nicer, although the usual depictions of it aren't quite like what is in the game, as we've just discussed with the Phlegathon. Zagreus asks Charon about this, saying that he thought Asphodel was meant to be a flower-covered meadow. Generally, Asphodel is referred to as the Asphodel Meadows, and is meant to be a pleasant, if not nondescript place, for the average person to spend their afterlife. Again, the Codex kind of mimics what I said before about what Asphodel is for, saying that the worst are sent to Tartarus, the greatest to Elysium, and all the others there. It's tricky to give too much info about this area, because even ancient sources don't give it nearly as much attention as the other two. There's more to say about Elysium, though, and I think that the most interesting thing about it is actually how you would get there. We know already that only the greatest, whatever that means, gain access to Elysium, but who decides that? Well, various afterlives have some sort of judgement system. In ancient Egypt, for example, the god Anubis would weigh your heart on a scale, against a feather representing Maat the goddess of truth, balance, and harmony. If your heart was heavier than the feather, it meant that you had led a wicked life, and the heart would be eaten by Amit, the devourer of the dead. Unfortunately, the ancient Greek one isn't quite as cool, but it's still pretty interesting. The underworld had three judges, Minos, Radamanthus, and Aeacus. And yes, that Minos is the same one from the Minotaur stuff. Here's an example from Plato mentioning the three of them. For if a man, when he reaches the other world, after leaving behind these who claim to be judges, shall find those who are really judges who are set to sit in judgement there, Minos and Radamanthus and Aeacus. The game does mention this idea, albeit vaguely. Hades says here that the dead are judged and sent to the appropriate place, and the Codex entry from Elysium mentions that there are judges entrusted to consider the many cases the master himself cannot see to personally. So that's how that works, if you're wondering. The judges basically weigh up what each person did in their life and send them off to where they need to go. One thing the game brings up a lot though regarding that idea is the criteria with which you get into Elysium. 
The character who brings this up the most is Patroclus, unsurprisingly. Here you can see him muttering to himself, and he says, I knew so many peaceful, decent men, but none, of course, are here. Instead, it is the warriors, the kings, the slayers. Great men? The standard for greatness is low indeed. It's probably worth mentioning that over a few thousand years, our ideas about what constitutes a great deed has changed slightly. Back in the day, it was a lot more to do with heroism, fighting nobly, having the favour of the gods, and succeeding in conquest, and this worldview informs Supergiant's choice to make Elysium what it is, a place for warmongers and killers. Now I think we'd assume it was more correct for judgement to be made based on moral grounds and kindness rather than killing more people than the guy next to you. I guess it depends on how you define good, right? Look at this extract about Elysium from Pindar. The good receive a life free from toil, not scraping with the strength of their arms the earth, nor the water of the sea for the sake of a poor sustenance. But in the presence of the honoured gods, those who gladly kept their oaths enjoy a life without tears, while the others undergo a toil that is unbearable to look at. To be honest, I don't know enough about the philosophy behind the subjectivity of goodness, so I think it's best that we move on at this point before this gets away from me. So how did it go? How did you die ignobly this time, pray tell? Cerberus and I can't wait to hear the tale. In that case, I'll spare you the details. Fine. Your failure is quite easily imagined. How often it recurs. Almost as though my realm is built to keep you here. You and every single soul that's ever lived. But by all means, continue struggling. We're going to skip over two of the Codex entries, the Temple of Styx and Chaos. The former will actually come up a little bit in the next section, and we're missing Chaos out because I kind of already spoke about Chaos as a character, and I don't think there's anything else that I want to add to that. That means next up is Erebus. As an area, this doesn't get brought up in the game nearly as much as the areas we just spoke about, but let's have a look at what is said about it. The general idea seems to be that Erebus is like a holding room for the dead, before they pop off for the judgement we just chatted about. The Codex calls it a waiting area, which lies shrouded in darkness and the narrator calls Erebus the place wherein the dead await eternal sentencing, and that it's concealed in the dark recesses of the underworld. That's two points each for Erebus being a waiting area and being dark. What else does the game say? Well, the only other noteworthy mention was from Asterius, who said that he was cast into Erebus when he died, and seems to imply that it was because he was a monster? Maybe I'm reading into that wrong, but that's how it appears to me. But yeah, we have three things here. Waiting area, dark, and maybe monsters get sent there. It's tricky to cross-reference here, because similar to Nyx, there isn't too much record of Erebus in Greek myth. The main things we know are that Erebus is a primordial deity, and similar to how Nyx is the night, Erebus is darkness. That explains the references to the dark, obviously. In case this helps for context, here's Hesiod explaining it. From chaos came forth Erebus, and black Nyx. But of Nyx were born Aether, and Hemera, whom she conceived and bore from union in love with Erebus. The upper air thing that Aether represents, by the way, is only the air that the gods breathe, not that normal mortals breathe. As for the waiting area thing, there does seem to be precedent for that too, but this is one of those instances where I can find people talking about it, but I can't seem to pin down a concrete source that says it. That's probably just a failure on my part to do the research though. But yeah, similarly to how the Acheron and the Styx were occasionally conflated, as both being the river which needed to be crossed to access the underworld, apparently Erebus was sometimes considered the waiting area, as opposed to the banks of either of the two rivers we just mentioned. Sorry that I've not been able to tell you more, but you'll just have to take my word for it this time. Unsurprisingly, because I couldn't find a source for that, I can't find a source for Erebus being a holding pen for monsters either. Again, there's the odd mention of Erebus being mixed up with Tartarus, which I'm pretty sure is where monsters would actually go. But who knows? It's a shame not being able to give you more specific details, but that's about all that I have on Erebus and how it's depicted in the game. A hidden stretch of the boundless river Styx cuts through misty Erebus, providing for the river boatman Charon, a locale in which to deal with the unruliest of souls. Nice place you got here, mate. <sighs> The last location in the Codex is Greece, and considering Greece is just an actual country, I'm not going to talk about that. What I will talk about is something that the Codex brings up, the entrance to the Underworld. I was born in a land with next to nothing in common with the Underworld, 
save for the fact that it happens to contain the surface's single entryway into this realm. So, do we know where the underworld was supposed to be then? There are a few options to be honest, but if we're talking specifically about Greece, then I think the most likely entrance is the Necromanteon of Acheron. We know about the Acheron by now, we even mentioned that people believed it flowed into the underworld. As for what a Necromanteon is, it's a temple where it was believed you could commune with the dead. Funny enough, you might recognise this if you've read the Percy Jackson series, in particular The House of Hades, which is the fourth book in the Heroes of Olympus saga, and it's also quite comfortably the best Percy Jackson book. It's very strongly implied that this specific Necromanteon is the one that they're heading to in that book, and this temple is actually what the title House of Hades refers to in the series. Anyway, there is a place in Greece which is supposedly the entrance to the underworld, but is there maybe more to it than that? For a while when researching this video, I didn't believe that the Temple of Styx in the game was a reference to anything in Greek myth, but a part of me wonders now if it's actually a reference to the Necromanteon of Acheron. It fits in some ways, it's in Greece, it connects to an underworld river, but I'm still not convinced that this is meant to be that place. There's another potential underworld location in what is now modern day Turkey, not too far away, called the Plutonian at Hierapolis. Something about this one caught my eye, and it's that the passage underground at this temple is basically filled with poisonous gas, and that kind of reminded me of all the passageways in the Temple of Styx, with all the deposits of poisonous gas you'll find there too. This location, like the Necromantion, was known to the Greeks, and the geographer Strabo said this about it. Any animal that passes inside meets instant death. I threw in sparrows, and they immediately breathed their last and fell. Anyway, the point is, there are supposed entryways into the underworld, but I'm not entirely convinced that the one in the game is meant to be any specific one in the real world. I find it interesting that they definitely have stuff in common, but I imagine that just comes down to Supergiant being incredibly good at research. Either way, even if we don't get a conclusive answer, just having fun trying to figure it out is still worth it. The surface, windswept, cracked by freezing cold nonetheless instills within the prince a sense of awe and the sublime, for it is unlike anything that he has seen. Okay, we're on to our final proper section now. Weapons. Obviously, the heavy majority of this video is about the characters, and the locations and weapons are more like a chaser, but there's still some really interesting stuff to talk about here, even if it is a shorter section. There are six main weapons in the game, and we're going to try and talk a little bit about each of them, focusing primarily on things like if any of the weapons actually existed in some sense, and why certain aspects were chosen. For example, my favourite weapon was the Chiron aspect of the bow, and there's a bit of precedent for why Chiron has a bow aspect, so I'll be able to give you a little bit of fun info about that. However, this isn't the case for all of them, and if there isn't much to say about a specific weapon or aspect, I'll just skim over it rather than try and make something out of nothing. This video is long enough as it is. To start, it's worth saying that every weapon has a Zagreus aspect as default, so we're not going to try and read into that for any of them. Anyway, first up is Stygius, or the Stygian Blade. There is no equivalent to this weapon in Greek myth. To be honest, there's barely any important swords in Greek mythology. Long-ranged weapons tend to play the biggest role. It's funny to bring it up again, but the only other place I can think of where you'll see mention of a Stygian Blade is the Percy Jackson books. You do find scant mention of some mythological swords throughout ancient stories, but none that are really important enough to bring up and discuss. It's a weird one. The only thing I can think of that's really relevant is actually a type of sword. It's called a harp, and I'm not totally sure I'm pronouncing that right, but I guess that doesn't really matter. It's essentially a sword with a hook on it, and it played a part in two myths that we've already brought up in this video. Firstly, as you can see from this sculpture, it was the weapon with which Perseus beheaded Medusa. Secondly, there's some debate as to whether this was what Kronos used to castrate his father Uranos, but I'm not sure about that one. It still seems like you come across more sources that say Sickle or Scythe. As for the aspects, we have Nemesis and Poseidon from the Greek pantheon. We've spoken about Poseidon already, so we'll start with him. In the game, Poseidon mentions that Stygius wasn't quite his type, and Hades also says that Poseidon was never any good with Stygius, that he grew envious of Hades and his spear, and now Poseidon is more famous for having a spear than Hades is. Poseidon certainly is famous for his trident. If you remember back in the Hades section at the start, I mentioned that the Cyclopes made the Helm of Darkness for Hades in the war against the Titans. Well, what they made for Poseidon was his trident. The Codex implies that Poseidon used a sword in this war, and this just didn't happen. I don't know if he was ever depicted using a sword, to be honest. 
You'll notice by reading the info in the game that each of the first six Olympians, the children of Kronos and Rhea, used one of these weapons each against the Titans. They gave Hades a spear, we've mentioned his Biden already, so they had to give Poseidon something else, and they chose the sword. But Supergiant will have known this, obviously. They just had to give him the sword to help their narrative, and there's nothing wrong with that. Now for Nemesis, the other Greek aspect. I brought up Nemesis really briefly when we started talking about the Furies, because it is also her job to mete out justice. She gets mentioned briefly in a conversation with Thanatos, who gives you the idea that Nemesis is not someone to cross. It's nice that you get bits of dialogue here and there about gods and goddesses who don't actually feature in the game. Anyway, does Nemesis have a sword? Yeah, I think we can say yes on that one. There aren't loads of ancient sources saying so, but it definitely seems to have become more of a thing over time, which is still totally valid. You can find sculptures and paintings which depict her with a sword, and that's more than enough to convince me. When it comes to how the swords both look, the Nemesis and Poseidon ones, I can't see anything in them that is like an obvious reference to anything in particular. Might be missing something, but I'm not sure. As for the final aspect, we get to talk about a new branch of mythology, which is pretty fun. Each weapon's final aspect belongs to a set of myths outside of Greek mythology, and the first of those is the aspect of Arthur, who is unsurprisingly from Arthurian legend. The weapon is called Holy Excalibur, and was wielded by King Arthur, a legendary king of Britain. It almost seems too obvious to discuss Excalibur, considering how widespread knowledge of it is. I mean, I grew up in the UK, so there's every chance that my perspective on this is biased or atypical, but I can't really think of a more famous weapon from any mythology. It's so ubiquitous in modern media. If you've played a JRPG, the chances are that it had a weapon called Excalibur in it. There was even a Disney film called The Sword in the Stone, which despite issuing the Excalibur name, mimics the exact story of Arthur retrieving the sword and thus becoming the rightful king. This is where the waking phrase used in the game comes from. I see your kingly pardon from a prison of stone. There is specific precedent for this sword being Excalibur, but as we know by now, myths are messy, and there's also a school of thought that Excalibur is actually granted to Arthur by the Lady of the Lake. Some stories say both were Excalibur. Anyway, the point is, Arthur was a mythological king of Britain who ended up wielding the sword Excalibur. As for why the game calls it Holy Excalibur, it's probably to do with the heavy Christian subtext dotted throughout Arthurian legend. However, Excalibur as a weapon does often come with the holy element in the Final Fantasy games, which as far as I'm concerned is a reputable source, so I'm going to go with that instead. Calm down, Skelly. I'm sure whatever it is is perfectly normal for a legendary semi-sentient titan-slaying weapon from the dawn of time. Weapon number two is Varatha, the Eternal Spear. Now, although spears are a bit more commonplace than swords throughout Greek mythology, this particular one is, like Stygius, made up. The name is a bit strange, because to me it looks decidedly un-Greek, and I was struggling to find any mention of it, so as a last resort I popped into Google Translate, and apparently it's a Tamil word, meaning either do not come or absent. No idea if that's accurate. Can't really see a link, but if we're really fishing for one here, this weapon was the one that was wielded by Hades during the Titanomachy, according to the game, and Hades is absent compared to the other Olympians, because he stays in the underworld. Wouldn't read too much into that myself, though. As for aspects, we've got Achilles and Hades. We'll keep the Hades section very short, because we spoke about his weaponry a wee bit at the start of the video. The only thing worth really bringing up here is the weapon he started using after he discarded Varatha. The name gets brought up a few times, Gygaros, and again, surprise surprise, made up. It's a pretty hefty weapon, so I assume that's where the gigabit at the start comes from, but I'm not really sure. Let's talk about Achilles now, because there is actually something to say there. The Iliad extract in the Achilles section about him and Agamemnon contained the phrase son of Peleus, referring to Achilles. So it won't come as a surprise that his father was a guy called Peleus, a king like everyone in Greek myth. And interestingly, Peleus was the son of Aeacus, who later became one of the judges of the Underworld, which we mentioned not too long ago. Anyway, there is a reference to Peleus being given a spear as a wedding gift, although the source is pretty niche. At the marriage of Peleus and Thetis, the gods gathered together on Pelion to feast, and brought Peleus gifts. Chiron gave him a stout ashen shaft, which he had cut for a spear, and Athena, it is said, polished it, and Hephaestus fitted it with a head. By all accounts, this spear was passed down to Achilles, and it was what he used throughout the Trojan War. So ultimately, there is pretty specific precedent for Achilles using a spear, which is nice. I can't speak for whether or not the one in-game is meant to be this one, but I'd like to think it is. 
The shaft looks like wood, so it could be the ash from that previous quote. It definitely looks polished, it's pretty shiny. And the head of the spear is definitely the kind of mad shit that Hephaestus would cook up. Theseus calls it a handsome spear, and Artemis talks about how many mortals got completely slaughtered by it, so it totally could be the spear handed down by Peleus to Achilles. If so, that's a really fun detail. However, Achilles himself says that the spear was a gift from his old master Chiron, which might mess up that theory. Chiron did help make the spear given to Peleus though, so who knows. Chiron's involved somehow, at any rate. Our non-Greek spear aspect is Guan Yu and his Frostfair blade. You'll have to forgive me, my knowledge when it comes to Chinese history and myth is questionable at best, but I've tried to do a bit of research on this. Like Excalibur, the Frostfair Blade is a weapon that there is definitely mythological precedent for, which is a relief. Although, it's more commonly known as the Green Dragon Crescent Blade, which is why you see a wee dragon coiled round the weapon here. So, who was Guan Yu? The info the weapon screen gives us calls him a mighty general, Achilles calls him a great bearded warrior, and Ares calls him a future god of war. So yeah, that's pretty much it, Guan Yu was a general whose exploits were so frequently retold and glorified that over time he became retroactively deified, rather than being a war god in the first place. The weapon itself is a Guan Dao, and is most famous for being wielded by Guan Yu in the 14th century novel Romance of the Three Kingdoms, a classic of Chinese literature. This story is also where the waking phrase for the weapon comes from. I see you through the eyes of the Crimson Phoenix is a reference to a description of him found in the novel. His eyes were like those of a Crimson Phoenix. I am admittedly out of my depth with this one, so I hope what little info I gave you was correct. You fight your father's legions with Varatha, the Eternal Spear. The irony must not escape him, for he long ago stood by my side against the Titans with that thing in hand. Next up, we have Karnacht, the Heartseeker, and my personal favourite of the six weapons by a fair distance. I'm sure it isn't a surprise at this point, but this also is not a bow from Greek myth. The name actually comes from my home country, Scotland. Take away the T at the end, and you have Karnacht, which is the Scottish Gaelic word for a funeral dirge, a song of lamentation, that kind of idea. Because it's called the Heartseeker, there could also be some sort of etymological link between the core at the start and cœur, the French word for heart but I think it's most likely from Karnach. Let's move on to the aspects. First up is Chiron. Chiron in Greek myth was a centaur, and according to Homer, the wisest and justest of all the centaurs. The main thing Chiron was known for was training heroes. He trained Hercules, Jason, and most pertinent to the game, Achilles. You'll know this already though, because I brought it up just a second ago when we were talking about his spear. As for Chiron's bow, Achilles says that it shined like the sun, and never missed its mark, although he attributed that to Chiron's extraordinary skill. It's almost disappointing, but there's not much to be found about Chiron actually using a bow and arrow. However, there's plenty to be found about him instructing heroes in the ways of archery. After all, he did learn from the best. Apollo and Artemis, the gods of archery themselves, supposedly took Chiron under their wing when he was just a baby centaur, and taught him all the stuff they knew. Maybe that's why Chiron's bow supposedly shines like the sun, some sort of reference to his tutelage under the sun god. Could be. As for the other Greek aspect, that of Hera, there's nothing to say. We know who Hera is, the queen of the gods, and she never used a bow. The skulls on the Hera bow look really cool, but I can't think of a specific reason why they're there. That doesn't mean there isn't one of course, but I have nothing to say about this one. The non-Greek aspect of the bow belongs to Rama. Rama is part of the Hindu pantheon, and is one of the avatars of the god Vishnu. Hence the waking phrase, I see you drawn in the arms of the seventh avatar. You can see it says Celestial Sharanga on the weapon screen, and this is because Sharanga is the name of a bow used by both Vishnu and Rama, so that's where that comes from. If you don't know who Vishnu is, I'll do my best to explain it here, but it will be very simple because again, I'm far from an expert. There are loads of gods in Hinduism, but there are what you could call a main three, also known as the Trimurti. There's Brahma, the creator, Vishnu, the Preserver, this is why it says the Preserver on the weapon screen, and Shiva, the Destroyer. These deities essentially personify the cycle of life, things being made, existing, and then not existing. Again, I'm going to leave it there, if there's anyone in the comments who's more clued up on this, or the Guan Yu one, please let me know a bit more about it. Ah, you will coronize the Heartseeker. It pierced three titans in one shot back in the war amongst our kind. 
Please do take care of it. Weapon number four is Aegis, the Shield of Chaos. This is the weapon we've discussed most in the Athena section, so I'm honestly not going to say much about it as an introduction. The first two aspects are Chaos and Zeus. I might be wrong, but Chaos is almost never personified in Greek myth, and I highly doubt that if he was, the first thing they'd give the almighty creator is a shield. Zeus carrying a shield has definite precedent though. The Gorgon face we spoke about in the Athena section, that you would find on the aegises of Zeus and Athena, actually seems to be on the Zagreus aspect. It's tough to make out, but you can see the vaguely snaky tendrils coming from the skull. Although, the Codex does say that whatever is on the shield is a monstrous entity that even the Titans feared. I'm not sure who that could be, but it would likely have to be one of the original monstrosities, something like Typhon. That also makes me wonder what the face on the Zeus aspect is. It's unlikely to be a Gorgon because the face is far too nice. There seem to be hands coming from the face too. I'm not really sure who this is meant to be, so again, theories are welcome. Additionally, the game claims that the shield is what Zeus used during the war with the Titans, but again, I'm not sure that's exactly accurate. What the Cyclopes designed for Zeus to use in that war was actually his lightning bolts, not the Aegis. But again, it's what we've already said. They've tried to pick a weapon for each god, and it isn't that hard to find evidence of Zeus using a shield, so it makes sense why they've done this. The non-Greek aspect for the shield is that of Beowulf, who Zagreus calls a supposedly unstoppable dragon-slaying warrior. Beowulf is an epic poem written in Old English about a bloke called Beowulf, who becomes a king and fights monsters. Classic stuff. To me, it always seems like Beowulf would be part of Norse mythology, because the poem is based in Scandinavia, but it technically isn't. How the game has dealt with this is a bit weird. The word Nagling exists in the Beowulf story, but it's actually his sword, not his shield. Nagling's board isn't a term that existed before this game, but you get the impression that they knew that, saying on the weapon screen, would that the stalwart warrior king's sword offered similar protection. It's a bit peculiar. When Beowulf fights the dragon, there is definite reference to him having a shield and it protecting him from the dragon's flames. This is where the waking phrase, I see you stand your ground against the serpent's flame, comes from. But it might be a bit hyperbolic to call it fire eating, like Ares does. Also, Beowulf dies from his wounds after slaying the dragon, so I guess that's where the supposedly comes from when Zagreus called him supposedly unstoppable. This one is a bit weird. Like, the pieces referring to the myth are all there, but I can't quite seem to complete the puzzle. You bear Aegis, the original itself. My own shield was forged much later in its image. You'll have to tell me someday how you found it. Our penultimate weapon is the Twin Fists of Malfon, the original boxing gloves. Now, I know we've had a lot less success in finding stuff that matches up in these weapon sections, but this and the next one are just a bit silly. These did not exist, obviously. I don't think anything like this really existed in myth, and it goes without saying that Demeter did not cut about sucker punching the fuck out of the Titans. However, the Twin Fists are actually really cool, and I like the idea a lot. Reminds me of the Nemean Cestus from God of War 3. The name Malfon is pretty interesting. I expect it comes from two separate roots, one Latin and one Ancient Greek. Mal, as a prefix, is pretty ubiquitous, you'll already know that it means bad or evil, and it comes from the Latin adjective malus. The fon bit is a bit less obvious, and could potentially come from this word, meaning sound, but I think it more likely that it comes from phonos, meaning murder. You might remember that from the Tisiphone section earlier on in the video. Everything's connected. The game tries to get across that these weapons fill you with a kind of bloodlust, with Athena saying that the fists are prone to fits of savagery, quite unbecoming of a well-trained warrior. I mean, there are plenty of moments in Greek myth where weaponless combat took place, but nothing like what you see here in the game. But again, I keep saying it, nothing wrong with that. It has to prioritise what's going to be fun to play, and the Twin Fists are really enjoyable to use. So we're just going to skip over Demeter. Talos is the other aspect, and quite an interesting one, the only aspect in the game not based on some sort of god or hero. The Talos was a giant bronze automaton, most likely created by Hephaestus. Its job was either to protect the island of Crete, or to protect Europa, who you might remember from the Zeus section. Honestly, the Talos doesn't play the biggest role in Greek myth, and is probably most famous for its appearance in the 1963 Jason and the Argonauts film. This is a pretty cool reference, but I don't know what it would have to do with our wee pair of murder gloves. The final aspect for these is that of Gilgamesh. No, not that Gilgamesh. We're talking about the ancient god-king Gilgamesh of Sumerian and Mesopotamian legend. 
The Epic of Gilgamesh is actually regarded as the oldest piece of literature ever, which is kind of unbelievable. So first, we'll look at what the game says about Gilgamesh. Asteria says, An ancient hero fought a beast of a man barehanded, and they became friends in the end, mimicking the relationship between him and Theseus. But what's being referred to here? The beast of a man who became a friend was Enkidu. Enkidu was a man, but was wild, feral essentially, and had to learn the ways of humans. He was also potentially part bull, just like the Minotaur. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, Enkidu and Gilgamesh eventually wrestle after a disagreement, and acknowledging each other's strength, become friends. This fight must be the reason for Gilgamesh being chosen as an aspect for Malfon, although curiously enough, it actually seems to be Enkidu's claws that you're using. Eventually, in the story, Enkidu dies, which explains the waking phrase, I see you overcome the wild, and make peace with death. One tiny additional thing is that upon seeing the Gilgamesh fists, Hades compares them to that of a manticore. A manticore is a monster from Greek mythology, with the body of a lion, the tail of a scorpion, and the face of a man. Creepier than it sounds, to be honest. But the Enkidu claws definitely do look more like lion paws than anything else, so I totally get where he's coming from. What are those bestial gloves of yours, blackguard? Beginning to show more of your true and savage nature here, perhaps? Okay, the last weapon. This is Exagriff, and it is a gun crossed with a grenade launcher. Do I even need to say it? Actually, what I'll do is let Amir Rao, studio director at Supergiant, talk you through it instead. One of the things that can really help with creative problems is to give yourself a little bit of space. So we took a little time, thought about uh, that move and fire weapon a little more, and realized in our hearts what we really wanted out of the weapon was for it to like feel and, and operate like a gun. Um, and so we ended up going in a direction where you could still stand still by fire, the secondary is a grenade, and uh, Greg had to make sense of it, so he called it Exagriff, the adamant rail. It's a firearm that is a precursor to all other firearms in the world, a weapon so dangerous it had to be locked away by the gods. So that's where we ended up, through the power of figuring it out, waiting on it a bit, and, um, and, and seeing what we really needed from it. What interests me, like with all the other weapons, is why they decided to call it what they did. Adamant is obvious, it's just a reference to the mythical unbreakable metal. Exagriff is the tricky one. The griff thing definitely seems to relate to the griffin, a mythical creature with the front of an eagle and the back of a lion, although I'm not entirely sure why. Maybe just to sound cool and so the design could also look cool? The exa part is the real head-scratcher though, but I think it's most likely linked to the number six. That is, the exa you'd get in hexagon, for example. I can think of two links, albeit tenuous ones, to back this up. Firstly, when I try to imagine a gun in my head, it's always one of those revolver-type ones with the barrel that fits exactly six bullets in. I told you it was tenuous. The more likely reason I think it could be a six is as a reference to Hestia, the final child of Kronos and Rhea who hasn't been given a weapon yet. Back in the Demeter section, I told you the order in which the six original Olympians were born, and Hestia was first. However, this also means that when it came time for Kronos to get on with the regurgitating, she came out last. This makes her the youngest in a way, as well as the oldest. It was this second post-regurgitation order which took precedence though. Zeus, the youngest by birth, became the most powerful, and Hestia, the oldest by birth, became the least prominent, the least important of the six. So much so that eventually she actually ceded her spot amongst the Twelve Olympians to Dionysus. Out of interest, this story has become pretty widespread, but I don't think there's a single source for it, so it must have been a more modern invention. Anyway, it goes without saying that humble Hestia, goddess of the hearth, did not wield a magical machine gun and mow down the titans. But as a fire goddess of sorts, it does make sense for her to have the weapon that fires the most. The other Greek aspect is that of Eris, the goddess of chaos and discord. The weapon screen calls her Strife, which you might recognise if you cast your mind back to the next section. But then again, that was hours ago, so I wouldn't blame you if you didn't. Eris is a daughter of Nyx, and one of those personification gods. She exists opposite Harmonia, who is unsurprisingly the personification of Harmony. It's like that whole they balance each other out idea. Anyway, the most interesting thing about the Eris weapon is actually its design. And again, I'm hoping this isn't the most wildly tenuous thing, but I'm convinced that this weapon looks like an apple. Unfortunately, I've asked other people and they don't really see it, but I'll do my best to explain it. It's particularly in this smaller image, rather than the full-length one. 
And maybe if you look too hard you won't be able to see it, but I'm hoping maybe some of you can get where I'm coming from. Primarily it's a colour scheme thing. Picture a cartoon apple with a bite taken out of it, the vibrant red skin, the crisp whitish flesh inside, and a wee green leaf poking out the top. I mean, my immediate thought when I first saw it was that it was an apple, and then seeing the Eris connection I was pretty pleased and thought I was really onto something. See, the item most associated with Eris is the Apple of Discord. This apple is almost always golden in mythology, but we'll ignore that for the sake of making my argument look better. Back in the Aphrodite section, I mentioned how Paris was forced to judge a contest between Hera, Athena, and Aphrodite, and thus caused the Trojan War. It was actually Eris who, in her indignation at not being invited to a wedding, decided to cause a bit of havoc, and used the apple to create a rift between the three goddesses. So, if the weapon is meant to look like an apple, that's a pretty cool reference. If not, my bad. The final, final aspect is that of Lucifer, Big Daddy Devil himself. I would hazard a guess that of all the non-Greek aspects, the story of Lucifer is the one that people would be most intimately familiar with. His waking phrase is, I see your prideful fall down from the heavens to the flames, and this is obviously a reference to Lucifer being cast down by God in some versions of the Christian tradition. The weapon itself, though, is probably a reference to John Milton's Paradise Lost, in two ways. Firstly, Milton has a thing for mentioning adamant in a hellish context throughout the poem. It starts off by saying that Satan is cast down to bottomless perdition, there to dwell in adamantine chains and penal fire. So no wonder his weapon would be the rail of adamant. By the way, I'm aware that there might be a bit of contention with calling Lucifer Satan, but Milton conflates them, so while talking about his work, I will too. In Book 6 of Paradise Lost, Lucifer and the demons basically build a laser cannon. This sounds like a joke, but that's totally how I interpret these few lines. With heaven's ray and tempered they shoot forth, so beauteous opening to the ambient light, these in their dark nativity the deep shall yield us pregnant with infernal flame, which into hollow engines, long and round, thick rammed, at the other bore with touch of fire, dilated and infuriate, shall send forth from far with thundering noise among our foes. I mean, heaven's ray, infernal flame, hollow engines, thundering noise? I'm pretty sure that this is the inspiration for the Lucifer weapon, given that it shoots a fiery laser. And that's a pretty fun place to end it, right? The rail of adamant itself has found its way into your hands, cousin. A malignant thing if you were to ask me, and not one I would ever use myself. Unless perhaps I had no other choice. I suppose it must have been that way for you. It almost sounds a bit ironic considering the length of this video, but I think sometimes you have to know when to finish something. With a game like Hades, I could actually talk about a lot more. I haven't really brought up anything about the Hydra, the Fates, Nectar, and Ambrosia, but I feel like there could always be one more thing to talk about, and this is a good point to stop, so I think we're going to have to call it a day here. I will say now though that if there's anything relating to the game that you want to know about that I didn't bring up in this video, just ask in a comment and I'll do my best to give you some info if someone else doesn't get there first. But honestly, Hades was an absolute dream to play and to talk about, and I just had the best time with it. I can't give the team at Supergiant enough credit. Funny enough, I initially intended on this video being no longer than 20 or so minutes, but the more I played and looked into it, I couldn't help but keep expanding and expanding. The whole process for making this video took me six months, and I've never made a video longer than an hour before, so this has certainly been an experience. However, it's actually been a lot of fun being able to revisit a lot of my favourite myths and stories, and ultimately I hope you've enjoyed it too, and perhaps learned something new about the absolutely mental world of Greek mythology. As I said, this has taken me half a year and hundreds and hundreds of hours for me to make, and because of that I'd love for as many people to see it as possible, so every like, comment, subscribe, and share would mean the world to me. It also goes without saying that this wouldn't be possible without my incredible supporters on Patreon, in particular, my highest tier patrons, Christian Walter, Cloud3514, Ryan Teague, Subnats, The Greenhorn Lowborn, and Unseen Sounds. I wouldn't be able to do this if not for you, and I can't thank you enough for your support. If you'd also be interested in supporting me and the channel, as well as getting some benefits like being able to vote on polls regarding what videos I do, and getting access to Patreon-exclusive gameplay content, then please check it out. You can find the link in the description below. You can also follow me on Twitter if you want more frequent updates from me, the link to that is in the description too. Thank you so much for watching, and hopefully see you next time.